Welcome. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Green Growth Summit. I'm so glad that you can all join us and uh, for what should be a packed and interesting set of discussions at a key moment in the European calendar. Uh, my name is Elliot Whittington. I am the director of CLG Europe, which is a group of businesses coming together to advance the transition to a sustainable economy, um, and the Green Growth Partnership, which is our partnership with the Green Growth Group of Ministers. We regularly organise these summit sessions. Um, there have been an annual event up until last year, where obviously COVID made uh, disrupted an awful lot of event plans and activities. Um, we regularly organise these sessions as an opportunity to bring together key European decision makers, members of the Green Growth Group of Ministers who have um, undertaken a leadership role in terms of uh, uh, expressing ambition and, and action towards a, a green transition for the EU, and uh, businesses under the leadership of COG Europe who also support that, that transition and their direction of travel. So this is a space where we can explore how um, business, government, um, parliamentarians and others can and identify the opportunities in this transition and identify how to move things forward. Usually these events are in person alongside the EU Environment Council, which is taking place tomorrow, um, but for obvious reasons, this time we're, we're uh, undertaking this event as a virtual event. And for those of you, if you haven't already seen it, you can um, see there are previous events that we've organised underneath the Green Growth Partnership on our website at corporateleadersgroup.com. So feel free to look at those. So, Today um, we have a, a great set of discussions and we'll, I'll just kind of run through the agenda. We're going to start with a really excellent uh, welcome and opening where we talk about the vision for the economy, where the economy needs to be going over the next 10 years, looking at both the climate transition but also thinking about society as a whole. Um, and I'm very pleased that we have CISL, which is the organisation which hosts uh, CLG Europe, we have the CEO of CISL um, leading that that session, Claire Shine, and she'll be in discussion with Sharon Barrow, um, General Secretary of the International TUC. Um, I think that's going to be a really interesting um, sort of start to the conversation. And then we're going to dig into a conversation around the EU's FIP55 package. I said at the top of this, that this was going to be, you know, this discussion is taking place at a, a key moment. Um, with the FIP55 FIP package, we have a um, huge amount of legislation that is going to um, provide global leadership in terms of uh, legislation across the economy, putting the whole of the EU on track for its 55% target. But there are there are many questions um, that can be asked around that, much detail that needs to be dug, dug into. So we're going to have a really good conversation with ministers, state secretaries, uh, CEOs, all reflecting on, on that ambition, all reflecting on that, that uh, action and, and how we can move it forward. So, so a number of uh, voices there. We'll then have a brief break before we um, resume for our second panel, um, which will talk about the, the other upcoming moment, the other reason this is key, the road to COP26. Obviously that big global summit moment taking place next year. Um, and then we will have concluding remarks from, from Claire before we wrap up. So as I say, it's going to be a really interesting set of discussions and um, I'm glad that you were all able to join me for this and what should be a, should be a, a great session. Do feel free to um, highlight questions um, through the, the webinar structure and we will, um, they'll be relayed through me as chair and others um, and we'll try and kind of draw them into the conversation in the, in the discussion sessions as well. Um, and indeed many of you have in the audience have already kind of put questions forward in advance and thank you so much for that. Uh, so without too much further ado, I want to move us into our first session. So, you know, the, the title for this session, it's, it's been structured as a, as a warm fireside chat. It's fast forward, what's the, where should the society and the economy be in 2030? And as I said, we've got Claire Shine, the Director and CEO of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, um, who I'm very, very grateful has, has taken the time to join us, and Sharon Barrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Congress. Sharon is unfortunately grappling with a little bit of technical difficulties, so unfortunately we might be um, more listening to her than, than seeing her. Unfortunately, these things happen. But I, I know Sharon, with her expertise in the ITUC, in other kind of key groups such as the B team and the elders and, and many other partnerships, will have a, a lot of wisdom to share. So I think listening to her will be a will be a significant opportunity. Anyway, without too much further ado, let me hand over to Claire to take to lead the next session. Thanks, Elliot, and hello everybody wherever in the world that you are. Um, I'm sorry you can't see Sharon, who is uh, a force of nature. 
but I'm sure that her energy will come over on the screens. I can hear a slight echo, so if anybody isn't muted, may I be a pain and remind. We have Sharon, this is wonderful. Uh, so Sharon, I'm very delighted to see you in person. So this is a quick blockbuster first conversation. You all know that during the pandemic, we've heard a lot about Build Back Better, but we also know that back was flawed for many of the reasons that we understand. Today's discussion is setting the scene to look firmly forward um, for this summit, what can and must be done to 2030 to build forward better in ways that work for people, nature and climate. So who better to challenge us on future fit leadership than Sharon? She has deep roots in education and now leads the International Trade Union Confederation. And Sharon, uh, we have a really mighty question for you. What should a climate friendly, resource efficient, prosperous and ideal society and economy look like in 2030? So you can enter that huge question from whichever direction you would like. The floor is yours. In 2030, the world has realised the SDGs. We have reduced inequality dramatically. We have set ourselves on a path to decarbonise our future with massive uh, transition by all industries, just transition, beginning with the foundation of energy, but indeed across all technologies and practices. And much of our economies are actually now circular economies in nature, where we reuse and we redeploy the materials so vital for our survival. But we also have a world where people have rights, human and labour rights, where environmental standards are respected by all of us, and where there's due diligence by corporations, backed by government legislation, and indeed remedy through grievance procedures. So people are no longer subject to oppression and exploitation, and we have an ambition once again for full employment which was kicked off by the UN Secretary General's accelerator, global accelerator call to action in 2021. It set on a path in 2021 to have 400 million new jobs, decent uh, work, and to formalise at least half of the informal economy, around 1 billion people. 2030 sees us on track to changing the whole base of our society, both in terms of the way we respect each other, the production uh, um, uh, technology, and indeed that vital commitment to sharing prosperity through minimum living wages, collective bargaining and social protection. This is the world that we have been fighting for. So let me jump in there and let's focus in right now on the how because that's a, a utopia that few would disagree with. And I'm really interested to think about the role of critical stakeholders in taking that forward. Can you focus a little bit on what kind of partnerships you think with companies and investors could play a real accelerator role in this direction? So 2021 is the year for decisions. We are coming up just a few weeks to the climate conference, COP26 in Glasgow. But if investors aren't looking at where they're investing with an ESG lens, all investment, not parts of it going to the local green economy, but environment, social and governance standards that actually deploy the base of uh, all investment and then engagement and due diligence is followed up by taking responsibility to meet those environmental standards, to see decarbonisation happen, to ensure just transition and a rights-based future. We've got some $40 trillion clear of workers' capital, pension funds in the global economy, and we want it to be invested for good returns, but we want it to be invested on the basis that it won't be party to environmental destruction, or indeed to uh, oppression in uh, corporations or supply chains of working people. So bringing these different pieces uh, into interconnection is critically important. I often say that we talk so much about the climate crisis, 
but it's a nature climate crisis and you talked about the need for a just transition so there are many sectors that may not see themselves or many stakeholders that may not see themselves in the sustainability space who are absolutely pivotal to achieving this transition so how is the international trade union conference or confederation going about putting momentum into that change right the way across the ecosystem of the economy so consider that before COVID-19, we already had a convergence of crisis. We had historic levels of inequality, a broken labour market where 60% of our global workforce is informal. It actually has uh, no guarantee of rights, minimum wages or income, no social protection, no rule of law. And our emerging internet mediated or platform businesses are actually informal businesses. And of the 40%, we have indeed only got uh, two thirds of those with some sort of security. So precarious work is the norm. And if you think about the sharing of our prosperity, so it can build communities through demand, it can, it can ensure families can live with dignity. Look over the last 40 years of our global model and labour income shares like a roller coaster going downwards. So that tells you that we had those levels of inequality that must be addressed for everybody's security, for resilience, but also for business to have some sense of uh, continuing capacity to function and grow. We had the climate emergency and now we have COVID-19 and that's exposed these fault lines in our economy, plus the massive underfunding of health and care, health, education, childcare, aged care. These are interrelated crises. We have to deal with them in an interrelated way. The roadmap is the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. But unless governments raise their ambition, unless people build trust in, uh, in the transition because they know just transition is a reality, we're not going to be in the race to save the planet or to in, in fact reduce the social tension that people are feeling from despair. Yeah, I mean, the, we've seen in very acute ways how certain things act as a threat multiplier. Well, the poorest and most vulnerable in society are obviously the most at risk from the impacts of climate change. And we've seen that on the health space um, with COVID. So looking forward, there is clearly a situation where a viable economy, a living and living, a livable and living planet and society require these pieces to move together. Can you talk a little on how you're looking at the European package that is being proposed and how you think both for Europe and for the wider world that could potentially serve a beacon role? Well, for workers, we've said that we need a new social contract. There are five key demands. They are in fact jobs, jobs and jobs, a return to the ambition of full employment, climate friendly jobs, a just transition. They're about human and labour rights. They're about social protection, universal social protection. That's not indeed a safety net, but it's part of our fabric of solidarity. And of course, equality of income, gender and race. We can't do any of the things around our fifth demand, which is inclusive and the dignity of inclusion, unless we achieve, as I said, the SDGs, the Paris Climate Agreement, and we see mandated due diligence with grievance and remedy. We've built an $80 billion CSR industry, Claire, but it's failed people, it's failed the environment because what it does is corporations outsource audits. And of course, those audits tell CEOs what they want to know. This has to be indeed business practice embedded. You know, we need rights, we need just transition guidelines, we need the social dialogue. And Europe's on track with many of its initiatives. Will it actually uh, have the courage to see them through? We'll see, but the promise of mandated due diligence, the social and environmental taxonomy, the social pillar of rights, and now a, a commitment to indeed increase the minimum living wage and collective bargaining. But also on top of that, going beyond, which is uh, if you look at the UK in, in Wales and Scotland, They've already gone beyond GDP. They're already looking to indeed be accountable to people for the way they spend their money and what on 
and how it benefits both people and the economy. So this is the future we want. So for, for my final question, you touch on Wales, and I've always been inspired by the fact that they were one of the few countries in the world to create a commissioner for future generations. The paradigm shift that you're talking about, you talked about trust. You talked about the risk that this huge industry of CSR is not delivering or being seen as transparent um, or trustworthy. And I heard this week a great comment from somebody right in the middle of this field saying, the risk is that we do the wrong thing better. So for your final contribution to this summit, I would be interested to know what you think the first priority, the right thing needs to be now to absolutely create this movement for change that can reach out across sectors and players. So indeed, the Wales Commissioner is inspiring and Sophie talks about the good ancestor test. What do we want to deliver collectively as good ancestors? We want our workers to have secure jobs, our children and our grandchildren. We want them to be based on quality public education. We want them to have access to free healthcare, high quality healthcare. And we want them to be indeed able to judge, able to, to be confident that the planet is on track for sustainability. If we get these things right, if we put in place human and labour rights, due diligence with uh, indeed the UN human rights uh, guidelines for business test, that means compliance and it means uh, remedy. If we get the climate crisis under control because the partnerships through social dialogue and just transition are there with business, labour and government, and if government uses its legislative power but also its procurement power to make sure that our future is not dominated by corporate monopoly, is not dominated by exploitation, is not dominated by greed and environmental destruction, we'll get to that 2030 vision. That's fantastic, Sharon. It's a real call to action, um, both in terms of its global overview, bringing that back down to the regional scale, and also thinking about the different levers for change, all of which tease up Elliot and the great panel that's coming up, which will be focusing on the transformational change. So thank you, Sharon. I'm so glad we saw you in the flesh. And now I'm going to pass right back to Elliot to take up our first panel. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Sharon. That was a, a great start to the session, a great start to this, the discussion. Some really big themes, ambition, accountability, the just transition. Um, these, are, these are very much kind of core topics that I think we will be working with and building on as we move forward. So if I'm going to move us on to our, our first discussion session, um, which will be around on and around the Fit for 55 package, a transformational change for climate, people and the economy. Can the Fit for 55 package deliver? So, I mean, as I start this session, I think there's a, there's a few things I want to say. So firstly, I should say, you know, I welcome the audience. I'm going to note that we have a, num a large number of you here on GoToWebinar, but also a large number um, watching through the LinkedIn stream. So um, great to have both audiences or all that breadth of audience with us. I also want to acknowledge the the fact that the partnership rests on the support of business but also the support of governments. We're very grateful to the support of the, the German BMU, um, the, the government of the governments of Finland, of Luxembourg and of Norway who have helped make this event and this discussion possible. Um, so now if I move us on to, to talk about the Fit for 55 package, which seems to be something that I consistently have a problem in saying, lots too many Fs. Um, it's worth saying that we have um, in CLG Europe been looking closely at the package, been looking closely at the announcements um, that have made the first round of announcements that have been uh, unveiled as by the Commission. And I think what really stands out to us, um, so we've, we've, we've produced this re new report which we just launched today, um, which shows some of our kind of key analysis. What really stands out to us is the scale, the breadth, the interlinkage of, of the, the package. Um, it is a genuinely kind of inspiring um, attempt to, to deliver on the EU's 55% target. Um, but we do believe that there's more that can be done. We believe there are missed opportunities to really seize on synergies that exist between different policy mechanisms. We think there is um, more ambition that can be identified in areas like energy efficiency and electrification of transport. And we also think that there are kind of key issues such as the just transition, so looking at the impact on different communities, the costs and 
and job um, impact on different communities and the opportunities created by the sector economy all of these themes could be could be looked at more closely do have a look at that report it does have a have a lot to say we also say in this report we also say that business does have a key role in supporting the this this package as it goes forward and i think there is a number of things that businesses the businesses in the corporate leaders group are already kind of um saying but other businesses could also say around the fact that this package has to be treated as a package so you can't if you're if you're um seeing one area kind of that you want to see changes on bear in mind that that it requires a whole package to adjust to make sure it delivers the overall level of ambition the fact that this should be part of um, and indeed very much fits into the Green Deal as a growth strategy for Europe. So this is about generating new opportunities, building new industries for the future. And the fact that, again, business has a key role to play in terms of ensuring the, the inclusive, inclusive element, the justice element is respected, that we are thinking about the impacts on different communities. One of the key areas there is thinking very much about the skills agenda and ensuring that um, the economy as a whole can grow and that people are are reskilled and upskilled and able to be able to provide the workforce that we need, but also that they're able to get into, into the new jobs that are created, the new opportunities that are created. So uh, I do urge people to, to, to look at that. Um, and I, I uh, hope you will um, uh, have some interesting reflections on the conversation we're about to have. To start that conversation, we have we asked some from the Commission to come and uh, uh, present package to us and we were very grateful to get a video from Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans who obviously is the um, a, a close friend of CLG Europe and the Green Growth Partnership and the kind of um, key lead for the, the, this area of work. So um, uh, Vice President Timmermans has a, has a few words to say in terms of talking about what the package is trying to achieve but also the context that it, it's landing within. So without too much further ado I want to hand over to that video. Good afternoon and many thanks to the Green Growth Partnership for inviting me to speak today. The European Union is aiming to move to a fully circular economy, to restore biodiversity and to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. To set ourselves firmly on track, we have an intermediate target of a 55% reduction in net emissions by 2030, which is now enshrined in the European climate law, uh, which makes our targets legally binding on all member states. Our ambition is high, and we're moving fast to make things happen on the ground. Early summer, we released a large package of proposals that will make it possible for the EU to reach the minus 55% target. Our proposals bring a fundamental transformation across society and all sectors of our economy to confront the climate crisis head on. We will ensure a just transition that will leave no one behind. The Green Deal is a growth strategy and one where environmental, economic and social sustainability go hand in hand. Because for too long, they simply did not. This strategy will create new jobs and massive economic opportunities. It will provide more certainty to boost investment and innovation so that industry can lead the transition. European companies are part of the solution by investing in green technologies. You can take responsibility, grow your business, and make a huge contribution to the green transition, which is absolutely inevitable. The package strengthens our emissions trading system and puts a price on carbon in more sectors. This will bring significant additional revenues through auctioning of ETS allowances so that we can finance a smoother and fair transition. Our proposals support greater renewable energy and energy savings. They facilitate growing sales of clean vehicles and transport fuels, boosting green supply chains and economies of scale, and simply making clean solutions cheaper. The package also prevents carbon leakage via the new carbon border adjustment mechanism. Nobody's better off if our efforts here to bring down emissions simply pushes these emissions and the production that causes them across our borders. None of the measures we've proposed will be easy. And while they all bring clear benefits, we do face a difficult transition, a bloody hard one, frankly. In a society where short-termism dominates so many debates, we need to have the courage to take the decisions that help us in the long term. Our children and grandchildren demand it. The energy price hikes we see across the European Union put great pressure on governments and industry and, frankly, our citizens. 
They make it attractive to say, let's hold off on these expensive green measures. But in reality, we need to double down our efforts. Had we had the Green Deal five years ago, we would already be less dependent on fossil fuels and thus less vulnerable to these kinds of market situations. Soon, the world will gather at the COP26 in Glasgow. They will see that Europe has a plan and is committed to carry it through and reap the benefits of climate action. The recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirmed the extreme urgency. We can still keep the 1.5 centigrade Paris goal in reach while lessening the impacts of climate change if we act fast. This is a truly global effort. We need our partners to share the sense of urgency and raise their ambition as well. And we need global solidarity. The EU and its member states provide over 40% of the world's public climate finance. Other donors need to follow suit and private finance needs to mobilize as well. To fight the climate crisis, we know the objective and we have a plan to get there. Now everyone else needs a plan as well. I wish you all a very fruitful and interesting summit and look forward to continuing our work together. So, um, uh, hopefully this is a, uh, some, uh, a couple of great starting inputs for a discussion that should be fruitful and interesting. So without too much further ado, I want to move to the first set of panellists that we're going to hear from. Um, and uh, we're going to hear sort of introductory remarks from each of them. So I'm going to start with uh, a firm friend of uh, the Green Growth Partnership, member of the Green Growth Group, and our, you, you know, uh, normally our host when we have uh, run these sessions in Luxembourg, Carol Dishberg, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Sustainable Development in Luxembourg. Carol, over to you. It'd be interesting to hear your, your thoughts on this topic and this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Elliot, and it's a pleasure, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear pa panelists, to be with you at this uh, Green Growth Summit uh, 2021. So, uh, in order to answer the question, will this deliver, I think there's no doubt that the Fit for 55 package is a key set of legislation, which is very much needed to put into real-life practices the long-term goal of uh, climate neutrality by 2050 of the European Green Deal. Uh, and I think that the overall ambition of the package seems to be going into the right direction. Also, in my opinion, some of the elements could clearly benefit from further strengthening. So, and let me make one remark. If it comes to the climate crisis and the urgency we need, it's clear that we need to make bold decisions and we need to be quick. So even if we are only at the beginning of the negotiations of this package, a rapid agreement on the various le legislative proposals of this package is necessary in order to ensure that the implementation of the package both deepens and broadens the decarbonization across all economic sectors and this well before 2030. And it's clear, dear colleagues in France, that decarbonization will affect the entire society and the entire economic spectrum more than we've ever seen. So a deep transformation lies before us. But I also see, and I'm happy to see, that the majority of the economic actors has fully recognized this and is already seizing the opportunity that lies ahead of us uh, in order to be front runners. As co-legislator, together with the European Parliament, the Council now has to make sure that we provide a strong and also a predictable framework leading us all towards climate neutrality. And we note that this switch from fossil fuels to a decarbonized society has clearly also impact on our citizens. And this is why it will be crucial for us as politicians to ensure that no one's left behind and this huge transformation ahead of us will be um, just so let me quickly go into uh, some elements of the package one important new element is the creation of the new emission trading scheme for building and road transport and all those who i've seen before uh, during the last months see that um, i my opinion is that we have to have a better eu ets and we now have a new ets and i think that carbon pricing is undoubtedly a key policy instrument 
But I'm still wondering and asking if uh, this separate ETS for road transport and housing is the right way to go, especially if we look at the social impact. So we have to, to look at this very carefully. Rising transport and heat prices will be felt by our population. And I think we have to take care that uh, this instrument uh, will be developed in a way where we will take care of those who will be impacted. So the distribution of the ETS revenues via the Social Climate Fund has to be addressed in a careful manner. Another thing that I would like to highlight is that we have to make sure that even if we have this new ETS, there is still a very strong need for strong policy instruments in the sector of transport and housing, like, for instance, strong performance standards for cars and van. It is precisely such standards and mechanisms together with the incentives that are key to accelerate the transition on the transformation that we need. Therefore, the revision of the regulation on CO2 emission performance standard for cars and van is crucial. And unfortunately, on this point, uh, I'm convinced that we have to have more a higher level of ambition. I had hoped that for a much earlier exit date than 2030. Furthermore, the proposal for standards for trucks is missing. And I see a lot of opportunities if we shift for emission-free transport sector, if we invest into the right direction, into new infrastructure, into renewables. So there, especially, I see a lot of opportunities. And like the speakers previously, uh, let me also make the link to the SDGs, but also to resource efficiency and the circular economy. Because circular economy and climate, climate neutrality are closely linked and circular economy will open up a lot of opportunities into net zero transition. So it will bring economic benefits, including the creation of, new, of uh, sustainable green jobs. And here again, the link uh, to the cars uh, and to the batteries. And uh, if we are in the fr uh, front runners in that sector, producing the safest uh, batteries, this can only good, be good for our competitiveness. However, for me, it remains to be seen whether the interlinkages are sufficiently addressed in this uh, proposed uh, framework. So let me come to an end. So in general terms, I believe it is, is in our all interest, be it in the government, economic actors and citizens, to make sure that the Fit for 55 package provides strong enough incentives that encourage new economic models, promote climate friendly solutions, and uh, while at the same time we support a just transition, by doing this and being quick and bold, I'm sure that Europe will lead by example. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, wise words, as always. Um, the opportunity and the, the necessity to lead by example. Uh, this is a great, great note to finish on. So I'm going to keep us moving. We're going to hear from each of the panelists in turn, and then we will have time for a few questions. Um, spread around amongst the panelists. So um, I'm going to move us on to our, our next contributor, um, another minister. So we've got Andres Vizak, uh, Minister from the Environment and Spatial Planning from Slovenia. Andre, um, very glad you could join us and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Elliot, for word. Dear Green Growth Summit participants, it is my pleasure to address you just one day before the Environmental Council, where my colleagues and I have first formal discussion on the Fit for 55 legislative package. With European Green Deal, the EU has set an ambitious goal of becoming the first climate neutral continent by 2050 in order to reach the long-term goals for the Paris Agreement of the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, one month before the climate conference COP26 in Glasgow, the last science scientific reports tell us that collectively the world is not on the track to limit the global warming on 1.5 degrees. For that, we will need much deeper emission reduction already by 2030. The proposed package that we have in front of us follows the goal 
of enhanced 2030 emission reduction target that will enable the EU to continue to the global leader in the fight against climate change. However, this package is also about making a trans transformative change in our economy and society. We need uh, to uh, direct Europa towards inclusive and sustainable growth in this complex time of economy, economic recovery. We stand at a crucial crossroad. Rather than doing business as usual, we should seize this moment to build truly sustainable, circular, and resilience economy and society. But to, achieve, to, but to achieve this ambitious goal, all sectors and all stakeholders will need to contribute, especially the business. We need to work hand in hand, and opportunities like this are a valuable contribution on our common path to green transition. Uh, with this in mind, the Slovenian presidency of the Council is now steering the discussions on the Fit for 55 package into the next phase where discussions are getting more detailed at the working parties. As more and more details of the proposed climate and energy framework are considered, we must not lose the big picture. picture. Fit for 55 is an ambitious and crucial step in the right direction. The presidency is facing a challenging task of uh, carefully leading the discussions across various council formations in order for uh, all major elements is reduced climate and energy framework, namely carbon pricing, increased target and stronger regulation are carefully calibrated and harmonized. As I, follow, as I followed the discussion so far, member states have pointed out that the about set elements, including carbon pricing, should fit several preconditions. First, they should be adequate to achieve the set climate targets. Second, they should at the same time not harm competitiveness of the economy. And third, they should prevent negative social consequences for the households. To conclude, I follow, it follows that support measures are key if we want Fit for 55 to succeed. Slovenian Presidency will make sure that these and other issues will be carefully considered as Fit for 55 is taking shape. Our aim is to, our aim is to progress as much as possible on the files. I am very much looking forward to hearing your views and reflections on the proposals, as business sector is a crucial partner which will ensure the EU reaches ambitious emission re reduction targets. I wish you fruitful discussion on the Green Growth Summit and thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Mr. Minister Vidjak. Um, very glad that you could join us. I understand that you, you won't unfortunately be able to stay for the discussion, but it's that, those contributions were very helpful and uh, very interesting to hear, particularly your reflections given your given the presidency that you're currently leading uh, or, or should, will be leading. Um, so you, you talked very clearly about the role that the business community has. So without too much further ado, I want to move on to our next speaker, who is a representative of that business community. I'm very pleased to, to welcome Rafael Mateo Alcala. Um, so, Rafael, if you'd, if you'd uh, uh, able to turn your, your screen on and join us, um, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Acciona Energia, um, so the, the energy um, uh, section of uh, the Acciona, um, an a active member of the CLG Europe and, and readily engaged in the Green Growth Partnership. So, um, I would be very keen to hear from you your thoughts on um, on this on this discussion and your contributions. Thank you very much uh, for the for the invitation to participate in the in this very interesting panel. Over the past few decades, the, the scientific evidence has proved that the global warming was a very real thing, and yet. Uh, evidence in hand, 
we have navigated through different phases that have prevented us from taking action to put an end to the climate uh, emergency. First, we had climate denial, contradicting or ignoring the scientific consensus. Now we are going through climate delay, with many making long-term goals and promises that not warranty in a scenario in which the world becomes net zero by 2050. In reality, that we need today is climate determination. This becomes more and more limited in our carbon budget shrinks by the day. The IPCC made it very clear last month when they stated that this was the last report to be published while there is still time to, to stay below the 1.5 degrees objective. And the cost of standing still is, uh, is huge and measurable. To put it into the, cost, into the context, according to the Bill Gates Foundation, in the next decade or two, the economic damage caused by climate change will likely be, be as bad as having a COVID sizes pandemic every 10 years, and by the end of the century, even much worse. The European Union has today the chance to lead the world in the right direction through the historical piece of legislation that is the Fit for 55 package. It's the first time that a major economy area of the world has comprehensively reflected the measures needed to avoid the most adverse climate scenarios and its impacts on other nations. It can drive the net zero revolution. In other words, the package has the chance to become in the definition of climate determination. The European Union's position as one of the largest economy in the world means that coordinated policies at the European level can drive the transformation towards climate neutrality at home and abroad. The package is considering the impact that growing levels of ambition and a higher carbon price may have on businesses and how potentially adverse impacts could be best mitigated, making it a well-rounded legislative measure. Here's the thing. The Fit for 55 is not only necessary to drift the change, it also makes sense from the business's point of view. Through it, the European Union recognizes the autochthonous resources that will be the most important cornerstone in the transition, the renewable energy technologies. In fact, in Europe, it's efficient that we move towards a scenario where we are less dependent on resources that we don't have. Let's see these days. In 2019, the European Union imported 22 billion euros of energy products. I invite all of you to imagine what we could do if we reallocated all this money in the green economy. Indeed, the package generates a multi-structural opportunities in the energy sector and also in all the economy sector with a multi-decade view. It's creating growing focus from governments on green infrastructure and ballooning markets for pure place sustainability investments. The outcomes are very remarkable. The energy transition is an industry generator job generator is the onward to the necessary post-pandemic recovery. To achieve these measures included in the package, one thing will be crucial, the social, the social acceptance of the clean energy. It will be essential that efforts to highlight their value and positive impact compared with the fossil-based system. In the substitution markets, like the European Union, where there is still a large dependence on carbon emitting sources, the energy transition requires a change in the mentality of all. And this is the challenge itself. And by change, we mean the literal definition of the world, something that moves us beyond our comfort zone, and that, of course, will require an adjustment period. Now we are seeing the 90s movement from many stakeholders when uh, what is truly necessary is that citizens, corporations and governments become involved in the transition as the inaction cost of maintaining the status quo could be devastating. But social acceptance is not the only barrier faced by our sector. 
renewable energy faces two main challenges. And this is not the technology or the finance or the cost. The challenge is the permitting and the risks. In Europe, it's simply, it's very difficult not to, uh, to permit new plants fast enough to meet its renewable energy targets. And it must go hand in hand with the development of electricity grids that are essential for the integration of renewables and for the electrification. If the measures are not implemented, the achievement of the decarbonization goals will be not possible. To wrap up, uh, let me end on a very hopeful note. Although everything is yet to be done, under the wing of the European, European Union determination, we have the chance to unleash the potential that comes from being a pioneer in something revolutionary, the emerging new green economy that will position ourselves at the forefront of the uh, very inevitable climate responsibility. Thank you very much. Rafael, thank you so much. Um, I think some really powerful themes there from, from the social acceptance in, of this change through to this kind of keynote that we just have to get on. We have to implement it, but the, the huge opportunities that that implementation will create. So thank you for those those comments. And uh, we will call on you again to, to when we when we move to the questions and discussion part of the panel. But I'm going to move us on to our, our next panelist. So um, if I could ask uh, Pascal Confin. Um, uh, MVP and leader of uh, uh, chair of the Environment Committee, um, Pascal. Great to have you. Um, uh, always, always, uh, you always have uh, key insights to share. So great to have your contributions on this topic. Over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the objective is to share a few thoughts about the fit for uh, 2030 package, as we call it in the Parliament, because as you probably uh, know we uh, negotiated in the climate law more than at least 55. Actually, we negotiated 56.6 reduction uh, of uh, uh, CO2 emissions by 2030. Um, and uh, we are uh, very supportive of uh, the climate package of July uh, as a whole. <clears throat> and I'm personally uh, very supportive, for instance, of the uh, standards for uh, cars, and I think the uh, uh, balanced uh, uh, approach of the Commission between uh, dates uh, of 2030, 2035, or 2040 uh, for uh, the uh, end of uh, CMO vehicles and uh, non-zero emissions vehicles, uh, pushing, putting on the table 2035 is the right compromise because uh, I think 2040 uh, is too late uh, for climate, uh, but 2030 is uh, too early in terms of industrial change and capacity to radically change from, uh, uh, let's say, market share of somewhere 10, 12, 15 percent to uh, 100. So uh, that's why I'm very supportive of the balanced approach of the Commission, which I think is uh, both ambitious and practical. On uh, other elements of the package, uh, I'm very supportive as well in the Parliament of the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Uh, it's been uh, widely supported uh, in the Parliament in the recent years, and for the first time we have it for real. Uh, and uh, that's very good. Of course, there will be discussions with our partners. That's why uh, we keep saying that uh, we want, and everybody wants, a WTO-compatible uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. And that's uh, our reading of the proposal from the Commission, that it is WTO-compatible. Uh, it is mirroring the ETS, which is exactly what we need. It's not a tax, and having such a, a tax wouldn't be WTO-compatible, because precisely we do not have a domestic tax. We have domestic carbon price, and that wouldn't make sense to have something that couldn't be aligned with what we have domestically, because that's uh, uh, exactly what the WTO will not accept. So uh, I don't expect massive change regarding uh, the CBAM from the Parliament, but probably a CBAM that will be more stringent uh, in terms of timing or in terms of scope or in terms of what do we do with not only with a, 
uh, commodities, but also with uh, transformed uh, products, semi-finished products, finished products, and so on and so on. So working more on, not, not the details, because there are no details, but working more on the practicalities of uh, uh, how to implement uh, the CBAM, which scope, which speed, which speed than uh, questioning the principle itself. And then, uh, I'm not going to elaborate on all the 50, uh, the 2030 package, but um, uh, uh, the remaining part, of course, is the ETS uh, reform. And then, uh, as you might know, uh, I'm very skeptical uh, about uh, the extension of the ETS to uh, housing, uh, heating, and to uh, road transport. I'm very skeptical because we have quite quite substantial uh, analysis of the very limited climate impact it has. And on the contrary, we all know, and actually the sequence we are in on the energy price is another element moving in that direction, going in that direction. We know the very high sensitiveness of uh, uh, political uh, uh, parties and of governments uh, because of uh, reactions within the society on a rising energy price uh, for housing, uh, for heating, sorry, and for uh, fuel. So that's why I consider that at the end of the day, the cost, the political cost is, to, is very high when the climate gain is very low. And at the end of the day, why I consider that it doesn't work that much, that's why the impact on climate is quite low, it's precisely because households are not economically rational. So we, I am very supportive of the carbon pricing for corporates. So that's why we are very supportive of the first ETS, of the current ETS, and uh, the, 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 the higher carbon price we have now for, for the last year, I would say, start uh, uh, having concrete impact and start being in the zone where it uh, creates real incentive to shift uh, the industrial processes from uh, high carbon to zero carbon. We are, it's the starting point, but we are, we are now where we should be compared to previously where we were at 5, 10, 15, 20 euros, which doesn't make any sense in terms of uh, investment reallocation. We are supportive of that. I am supportive of that because companies are economically rational. They are able to calculate 10 years profitability rates. They are able to uh, fire and hire. They are able to change their suppliers and so on and so on. One household will not fire uh, its kids because it becomes too expensive to go to school, uh, to get the kids to school and then to go to work. Uh, buy a car because you live 40 kilometers away of the city center. So what works for corporates does not work for households. And that's the basic difference and the basic uh, uh, opposition, I would say, I have uh, with the uh, uh, Commission view on this. Uh, and then that's why we are working in the Parliament uh, to recalibrate uh, this part of the reform, meaning the extension of DTS, precisely to uh, have options on the table. And the, we are in the uh, analysis phase and, and probably still for a couple of weeks. And then uh, in, uh, let's say, November, we will be able uh, to put uh, options on the table uh, with one key constraint and one key element, which is we will not go, of course, uh, for something that would water down the climate ambition. So any change in the reform should secure the climate integrity of the reform. It's an obvious thing for me, for the energy community, and I hope for the Parliament. So that's my uh, analysis of where we are now in this is for uh, 2030 package, and maybe the last word will be that this package is one piece of an even bigger picture. And it's important that we keep the bigger picture in mind because the Green Deal as a whole, uh, it's more than 50 laws, five zero European regulation. So uh, that will be changed, reviewed or introduced between now, let's say last year, 2020, up to the end of 2022. We have green finance, we have the energy package, we have uh, uh, things that will be uh, coming in December on buildings and so on and so on. So the fit for 2030 package is, is one piece, one piece on an even bigger, bigger picture that we should all have in mind because what we are then start delivering 
is really unprecedented and I think we could be proud uh, of it. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, excellent. Um, and thank you to, to the whole panel. Uh, I think that's been a, a great series of inputs and, and discussion starters. And I, I sort of note, while there are a number of issues where people have taken a slightly different tack, which is natural, particularly this stage in terms of the policy development cycle, um, I think there's, some, there's a great commonality to this conversation, particularly I'm going to pull out the fact that there is, I think all the speakers have talked about the, the importance of keeping up that level of ambition in a big, complicated, multifaceted package we need to make sure that whatever changes, whatever actions take place, that the ambition level is protected. Now, um, we're going to, I will want all the panellists to come back and, and listen, but before before we kind of go into a broader discussion, I have a first respondent, which is uh, Wendell, um, uh, Wendell Trier, the director of Can Europe, um, who can give us a bit of a perspective from the NGO community on, on some of these conversations and some of these perspectives. Over to you, Wendell. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you for uh, giving me the <clears throat> opportunity to say a few words. I think that the previous speakers, as you already indicated, Elliot, have raised many of the key messages um, that we need to see around 355, also from an NGO perspective. I think that a number of issues were very clear, including the fact that um, the Fit for 55 is a unique opportunity to actually address the climate change challenge and that we need to be aware, and I think the summer and the impacts that we've seen in many European countries of climate change has really um, highlighted the need for action if we are to support the social model that we're currently having um, in Europe, because the impacts will be hard and the impacts will be especially hard for those most vulnerable, also in Europe, but of course also abroad. Um, I think it's important to see the Fit for 55 package and the different pieces of legislation also as an opportunity an opportunity, an economic opportunity, a social opportunity, um, and an opportunity for um, for environment uh, to revive. Um, and I think it's very important that we need to look at the social impacts, both the social impacts of climate action, but also the social impacts of inaction, and also look at the just transition from that perspective. And status quo can never be a just transition in the current situation, because again, those most vulnerable will be impacted hardest by um, inaction on climate change. Now, for some, um, not people in this panel, but uh, people in, in the outside world, the, uh, the package might seem challenging, um, but nevertheless, it is only a starting point because, as has been said, um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has made an assessment of all the different plans that countries in the world have um, for the near future, between now and 2030, and their message has been clear with the current plans. We're heading towards 2.5 or even 2.7 degrees of warming by the end of this century, something we definitely don't want to envisage. And instead, I think that it's great to hear that all speakers have um, stressed the need to stick to the 1.5 degrees objective of the Paris Agreement, which means that all countries will need to look at what can they do more. All countries, in particular, a number of international partners that have not really come forward with new uh, promises or new pledges, but also the EU will need to look at what can it do more. And there, the Fit for 55 is an opportunity to look at what can we improve. And in that sense, I would like to call on the co-legislators, but obviously also on all other stakeholders and in particular businesses to look at how can we improve and increase each and every file in the package to see how it can actually help us to go well beyond the 55% uh, emission reductions. And as NGOs, we prefer to go towards an emission reduction of minus 65%. And so each and every file, whether it's renewables, whether it's <clears throat> energy efficiency, whether it's the ETS or the effort sharing regulation, each and every of those files has an opportunity to increase the level of ambition. And one of the tools to do that is really to look and recognize where we are at the moment, because the real economy goes faster than uh, what our legislations sometimes foresee. And even while I recognize that there's a bit of an impact of the uh, COVID uh, restrictions, it seems that very likely the EU will reach minus, almost minus 35% of net emission reductions in 2020, which gives us a huge 
step forward um, as to the 20% that was envisaged and makes going beyond 55% really possible if we include the real world emissions into the legislation rather than start the legislation from the um, unrealistic 20% as some of the uh, proposals currently do. So a, a clear message. Um, yes, we, we believe this is an opportunity. Yes, we believe that ambition is necessary and it, it is possible and we, we call on everybody to make this happen. Thanks. Thank you, Wendell. And actually, I would I suggest you, you stay with us for the for the panel discussion. We're going to. So if if uh, if, if uh, Carol, Pascal, um, uh, Raphael can can join us again, I think Andre has, has left. Um, so do do turn on your videos um, and stay with us and we'll have a short kind of five, 10 minutes, uh, quick reflection on some of those those questions. Um, Carol, maybe if I can start with you, I think one of the kind of key questions that was picked up was this question around competitiveness. And you touched, I think almost all the speakers touched on it, but I know that if I think about the two, two ministerial contributions that I think you probably took, talked more about the positive side of competitiveness. And of course, then there's concerns that are also expressed about that. How would, how would you see um, the opportunities around competitive, you know, what, what do you see that the package needs to do to ensure that European competitiveness develops and prospers going forward? So I see, um, basically, if, if you ask me if I think it's uh, it's good for competitiveness, if uh, we stay in the, at the front on our side, because if you look what happened, for instance, if it comes to the car sector, we, uh, Europe has not been uh, leading, for instance, and that's why I mentioned the circular economy, also having the whole uh, chain uh, being looked at if it comes to the battery sector. So if we will be able to, to, to be front running and have the best, the safest and the sustainable, for instance, battery production in Europe, I think this is good for sustainable jobs. The same goes for circular economy, the same goes for renewables, uh, for housing, and uh, also for uh, the electrification of, of cars as a whole. That's why I think putting more ambition uh, in some part of this package is an opportunity for the competitiveness of our economy. And it's not only leading to a safer world, because this is what we need. I think Wendell touched on it and so, so many uh, colleagues touched on it. We need to, to stick in order to have a safe world for future generation, but also for us living now, because everyone uh, remem still remembers the floodings uh, this year, but also extreme events, uh, fires. It's, it's a question of survival and also about sustainability of being able to have green growth and jobs in Europe. And I think every single thing I saw, for instance, if it comes to circularity, is that it's cre creating more jobs if you stay with the front runners. So for me, it's clear that this package has to be negotiated quickly in order to give a clear framework, because business is asking us a predictable and a clear framework. And that's where we have Carol. to deliver. Cool, sorry, I'd, I'm conscious that um, Mr. Koffer has to has to leave fairly soon, so I just wanted to come to him for one quick question. Um, just, I feel that the question of impact on people has been a really key part of this conversation. We talked about it, Pascal, others talked about it. Um, we heard about it from Carol just there in terms of you know climate impacts. We're hearing about energy prices. We're hearing about um, new jobs. Um, from your perspective as a parliamentarian, uh, what would you say are sort of some of the key concerns or key thoughts as to how we might engage normal people about the benefits and opportunities in this package? Well, uh, just two answers. The first one building on what uh, Mendel said. I mean, we shouldn't compare uh, the climate action scenario and the business as usual scenario because just there is no business as usual anymore possible. So we should compare the cost of inaction and the cost of action and the benefits of action and the benefits of inaction. And that's where all the studies, all the studies we have tend to, to conclude that the cost of inaction is much higher than the cost of, uh, sorry, the cost of inaction is much higher than the cost of action and the social injustice within the EU and even more globally of inaction is even higher than uh, the uh, climate action. So that's the first thing. And it's important that we compare two things that make sense. Otherwise, you just compare things like that. 
which is real, which is something which is not realistic anymore. Second, uh, as uh, 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 Franz Timmermans uh, says, uh, the transition will has to be just, or there will be no just, just no transition. And he's right. And that's precisely why I'm not in favor of the extension of the second DTS because it is completely anti-redistributive from a social perspective. And then you have to create a massive fund to compensate the problem you are creating. And then you start having transfer union. And then you start having people saying, well, I'm not in favor of transfer union. So you, it's very, very complicated to handle. But we try to, of course, take this social justice into account. So the best way to take it into account is to design a carbon market extension, which doesn't have any anti-redistributive effects, which is the best way to have uh, the, the to limit the social uh, justice or non-social injustice impact. Then beyond this, we have, as you all know, the uh, uh, transition fund just transition fund already in place, already working. So I can tell you that uh, we are all aware, all aware that uh, the just transition element is a key uh, dimension of the acceptability of uh, the transition. And we, on in the parliament, we will do everything we can to uh, have that up to the very end of the negotiation. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring the, the last two panelists in for, for a brief word. So, um, Raphael, you talked a lot about the opportunities. We've heard about the importance of green jobs. What do you think is the role of businesses in terms of making sure that the, um, the, there are people have the right skills for, for new jobs with, to take advantage of this shifting economy? Yes, sure. Uh, there is a, a big opportunity in terms of jobs. So the, the, the most important thing of their renewals is not that they are clean, they are local. And so we are, we are uh, when we are developing renewals in Europe, we are creating economy, GDP, and, and, and jobs, qualified jobs in, in Europe. We are not paying money to to the Middle East to import uh, gas. So the, the, let me put the, the, image, the, the, the image that we are importing gas to burn. We are doing fire with, with the gas or with the coal or with the fuel that we are importing. A lot of money every year, all the country in Europe importing fossil fuels to be used as a fire to, to disappear. Uh, so we, we can use a, a, a small part of the money that we are using for importing uh, fossil fuels to develop the industry, to develop the local industry. Let me say that the, the most important manufacturers of wind are European. So to, to develop jobs, to create qualified jobs, to create very distributed in the territory activity in order to increase our GDP, not just to reduce our CO2 emissions. So that's clear that the renewables are creating a new economy based in autochthonous resources. The, the, the advantage of the renewables is they are clean, but they are unlimited and they are local. So we need them to spend money in other markets, in, in not European markets. The, the problem that we are suffering now in Europe with the gas price is that we were basing our transition in a product that we don't have. So we are today depending on the prices of the gas and the prices of the gas are not in, in, in our hands. Probably if we accelerate in the, if we had accelerated in the last five to 10 years, the penetration of the renewals, our dependency were less today and the impact of the gas prices in the European economy should be less. Uh, so we need to create jobs, create uh, renewals, because it's our richness. Thank you so much. Wendell, last word to you on this. Um, so you talked very kind of clearly about the need for action and you talked about uh, international leadership. I think a number of the panelists talked about this idea of setting an example. Um, and one of the things I'm going to ask is, this is a big, complicated policy discussion. How quickly can we, do we need to move forward with this? Is it better to to go fast, it's better to keep the to focus more on doing it properly. What's your sense in terms of the timing and implications of this conversation? 
Yes, thanks. Well, this is obviously a, a very challenging question because we need actually both. We need high quality. Um, we need to make sure that the policy that is put in place is really going to be robust. Um, also, because we just had most of these policies being developed a couple of years ago. Um, and unfortunately, that was on the basis of a target that was really low, the minus 40 percent. And now a few years later, we have to redo it. And, and that we shouldn't do again. I think now the, the legislation should be robust and, and allow for, for some flexibility. At the same time, it needs to be relatively fast because the legislation is already being in, implemented. So um, we're moving forward and currently we're moving forward still on the basis of the old target. And the longer we wait, the more difficult it will be actually to catch up. So in that sense, I believe that um, really, I would hope that the co-legislators manage to come to their final positions relatively early already in the next year um, and that we can get real negotiations running in 2022, potentially even finalizing it next year if, if that is possible. Um, so, so for us, there, there is definitely a level of urgency um, that is needed also because we, of course, see the continuation of climate impacts and, and it, it's now that things need to change. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you, all the panellists. Um, that's been a really good conversation. The Fit for 55 conversation doesn't stop here. So we have so many contributors on this that I'm going to move us on to a second round of inputs. So if I can if I can uh, thank this current round of panellists and, and um, uh, for your very helpful contributions and, and ask you to virtually leave the stage by turning your screen off and I'll move on to our, our next, next uh, speaker, our next input. Um, so I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by uh, Krista Mikkonen, uh, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change from Finland. Um, and so our, our next Green Growth Minister and uh, another supporter of this event. Uh, Krista, if I could invite you to, to, to turn your screen on and join us in the conversation and share your thoughts on the FIT55 package. Uh, yes, of course, it's a video message at this point. So I'm just going to uh, allow us to kind of hear that message. Dear colleagues and participants of the summit, first of all, I'm very sorry for not being able to be with you live today. I hope you will have rich and fruitful discussions on how we can jointly ensure an ambitious, fair and cost-effective Fit for 55 package. Tomorrow we will have a first formal discussion between ministers on the, pack on the package in the Environmental Council. This will be the start of an intense period of negotiations. As we all know, the package is very broad and there are many interlinguages between the different files. This alone means that the negotiations will be complicated. Some details might of course change, but our main task is to keep the big picture clear. The package as whole needs to lead us to the at least 55% emission reductions, preferable more. And while of course we need to ensure proper time for negotiations, we do not have all the time in the world. The measures we will agree need to be implemented well before by 2030. The Green Growth Partnership has always offered valuable support in driving ambitious climate policy in the EU. We very much need this now too. All governments need to hear loud and clear arguments from progressive businesses that green transition is neither just a challenge nor, nor just a necessity but a great possibility. It will boost economic activity, create new jobs and inno inno innovations. Forerunners will be in a peak position to reap the benefits. We need you from the business world to stress the importance of a well-functioning, strong ETS that ensures cost-efficient emission reductions across Europe and provides price signals to support climate investments. We need you to stress that all sectors need to do their share and show examples of how different sectors can do their share. While there is now a lot of talk and concern about energy prices, 
in Europe, which is understandable. I believe one key answer is that we should move faster to ensure so that the re renewable energy becomes available and affordable for all. I also want to mention the important role of citizens. We need their support for the Fit for 55 package. Just and fair transition cannot be just a slogan. It has to be something we truly integrate in our climate measures. Let me also say a word on, on the international dimension. Only by acting ourselves, we can ask the rest of the world to follow our lead on the path to 1.5 degree compatible climate neutral society. I warmly welcome initiatives by European businesses to promote effective carbon pricing globally. Carbon price, when calib calibrated to Paris Agreement objectives, would be a powerful, cost-effective tool to spur climate. Finally, I just want to wish you once again a good and fruitful discussion at the summit, and I hope we can meet in person again at one of the future summits to take stock of how the package is proceeding. And on that note, I hope everybody will join the uh, join us for, uh, I'm sure, what will be a date next year. But um, I'm going to move us on to our, our next speaker. I think we've heard the, those words from the Finnish Minister, but we're very pleased to be joined by Annika Jacobsen, who is the State Secretary to uh, Per Bullen from Sweden, who is the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Environment and Climate. Annika, over to you. Thank you. And let me start by thanking you for the invitation and to underline also how important these kind of events are in bringing together various actions in actors in the climate transition. Many countries have raised their climate targets ahead of COP26 in Glasgow, but the EU can continue to manifest its global leadership by demonstrate how it will actually implement our enhanced ambition. With the Fit for 55 package, we are entering a new decisive phase. Now it is time to deliver. And in doing so, we must keep a steady focus on the long-term objective of the EU climate law to reach climate neutrality by 2050 at the latest. The latest IPCC report underlines the need for rapid emission reductions in the next decade to keep the 1.5 degree objective within reach. Achieving the at least 55% by 2030 will indeed require a variety of policy measures. A strong carbon price through the EUTS is of course key, but we do also need measures such as ambitious emission standards for cars, improved energy efficiency, and a fit for purpose energy taxation framework. As such, I would say the main challenge of the package is also what will, what will determine its success. We need a coherent framework where all parts fit together and reinforce each other. Let me give you an example. By improving energy efficiency in our buildings, we can reduce emissions while at the same time enhancing the comfort of our homes and reducing our energy bills. And also while renovating buildings, installing solar panels or uh, energy charging stations for electric cars, we will also be able to create new green jobs. So rightly implemented, there are multiple wins to gain. Ambition also spurs innovation. A great example is the reindustrialization of Northern Sweden, where we have had the first sample delivery recently of fossil free steel through the hybrid project. Undoubtedly, this breakthrough technology would not have been brought about without incentives such as strong carbon price. The EU, EU legislative framework and EU ETS must continue to support innovation and create incentives for zero emission techniques. This also underlines the importance of maintaining a steady focus on reducing emissions and in particular the phasing out of fossil fuels. Uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, of course, has a role to play in uh, mitigating climate change. 
but relying on less permanent carbon sinks will not drive innovation in the heavy industry. Building back better also implies leaving no one behind. Unprecedented levels of finance have therefore been made available through the MFF and the Next Generation EU to kickstart the green economy recovery after the pandemic and climate transition. Some point out, and, and rightly so, that the transition will be challenging. Wait, the higher the risk of locking ourselves in a fossil dependent past on top of facing the consequences of climate change. So to summarize, the time to deliver is now a coherent framework with a mix of policy measures focusing on emission reductions will be key. And the green recovery can help us deliver. I think I stopped there. So thank you. And, and Thank you so much, Annika. And uh, apologies, there was a little bit of a, a delay in the system. So, uh, but thank you very much. That was that was very helpful and very clear. Um, we're very glad to have you as part of this this conversation, and we'll we'll welcome you back for the, the discussion at the end of these inputs. If I move on to the to the next input, uh, we are very pleased to have another business voice. Um, so we have Annette Stube, who is the vice president, executive vice president of sustainability for Stora Enso, another corporate leaders group member. Um, Annette, very glad that you could join us and look forward to hearing your thoughts on the Fit for 55 package and the Europe's climate transition. Thanks, Elliot, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to take part of this uh, important discussion. Um, in my remarks, I will briefly cover firstly our planetary boundaries and the need for businesses to go beyond simply mitigating impacts and instead become regenerative. And secondly, the Fit for 55 package focusing on LULUCF and the ETS, where we see opportunities to make them even stronger. So just before I begin, a few words about Storenzo. We employ over 18,000 people in the EU. We are a renewable materials company offering uh, forest-based products that substitute fossil-based products. And these range from packaging, textiles, a construction, paper and pulp through to new biomaterials that we constantly innovate to achieve the highest value possible for the fibre. Um, one example is lignin, uh, which is derived from the side stream of the forest-based industry and uh, what used to be used for uh, bioenergy is now used to replace graphite in batteries. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, private forest owners in the world. We never harvest more than we grow and we safeguard biodiversity in all our operations around the globe. We are fully committed to be a constructive partner for the commissions in the pursuit of the Green Deal's visions. But um, obviously we don't claim to have all the answers today and there's always room to improve. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that later this month we will launch a new sustainability strategy and framework for the company. And this goes beyond the normal corporate responsibility and will help us operate within the planetary boundaries identified by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which we have used as a guide to set our targets. Two of these boundaries, uh, climate change and biodiversity, have a direct relevance for Storenzo. And we believe that regenerative business is key in ensuring that we stay within these boundaries. And so for Storenzo, regenerative means circular solutions that contribute to biodiversity and to tackle climate change. And, and my key message is really that causing less harm is no longer enough for companies. Uh, we must seek to become net climate positive and circular. And so for this, obviously, we need the right policy environment. Uh, and, and the Fit for 55 package is an important building block to achieve this. Um, alongside our mission to become regenerative, it will come as no surprise that we fully support the Commission's climate ambitions we need to reduce our emissions by at least 55% by 2030. And given this commitment, um, we are keen that we get the climate package right. So I want to take up two proposals in particular here, the revision of the LULU CF regulation and the revision of the ETS. So regarding LULU CF, it's essential that increased carbon removals in the forest are not used as an excuse for continued high levels of emissions in other sectors. European forests should not carry the burden of high emitting sectors. And for the EU to reach its climate targets, renewable materials will need 
to face will be needed to phase out fossil based materials which is a major cause of climate change and as such it's essential that the use of the forest is balanced in the eu regulation so that it's not purely seen as a carbon sink which was also mentioned before um, we are specifically concerned about the proposed integration of emissions from the agriculture sector into the Lulu CF sector, CF sector, creating a combined agriculture and forest sector from 2030 onwards. There is an imminent risk that the increased contribution of the Lulu CF sector to the EU's climate target will be cancelled out by a lack of emissions reduction in the agricultural sector. Um, and the uh, ETS has been a success. Uh, we hope this will continue. We had, however, hoped for stronger policies promoting carbon capture and storage, CCS, and biogenic CCS. BECS. Um, academia and scientists agree that CCS and BECS are needed if we are to reach the Paris Agreement. And simply linking BECS to the ETS price will not be enough to incentivize this technology to become commercialized in the time frame needed. And so Storenso is part of a consortium which piloted BEX, and we know that this technology is technically feasible. We now need to make it to make sure that it becomes financially viable as well. And to conclude about ETS, the proposal to exclude installations from the scheme where emissions from biomass contribute to more than 95% of the emissions is frankly hard to understand. It contradicts the logic of supporting the industrial transition to renewable energy. And the leap to reduce the last 5% of fossil emissions is often the most challenging. So it does not really make any sense to me. And just to conclude, finally, um, business need to step up to the challenge of operating within the planetary boundaries. The task for us as companies is to use this quest as a lens for product innovation and business model transformation. But the task of policymakers is to ensure that the policy environment allow this to happen, of course. And so the question for this panel was, can the Fit for 55 package deliver? My answer is yes, as long as we work together to ensure it delivers concrete measures that are also fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette, and thank you to all of the panelists there. I think there's a, there's a great series of <clears throat> contributions and, and comments there and, and themes that have come through around collaboration, innovation, reindustrialization, inclusion, circularity and regeneration and action across the whole economy. So, so some really big things. And of course, a name check for one of my favorite policy areas, Lulu CF, um, sounds a bit like a, an American hip hop artist. Um, uh, and actually is land use, land use change and forestry, um, a, a really key area that we mustn't, mustn't forget, particularly in this context of, if I hark back to the, the first round of speakers, this convergence of crises, the changes that we need to see in response to, to restoring nature as well. Now we have, um, so we've had our panelists, we have two respondents this time, um, both voices from Central and Eastern Europe, which I think is, is really key to bring those voices forward. I'm um, very pleased that we'll be able to join by Doru Mitrana, Program Director for the Sustainability Embassy in Romania. Doru. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. It was great uh, to, to hear all these uh, speeches about the level of ambition and uh, the fact that uh, all this uh, are soon um, become uh, legislation. So it's not going to be just uh, a call for a voluntary uh, voluntary action from the from the business uh, community and what i would like to to uh, point out and maybe raise for for discussion would be to um, a short uh, introduction in the instruments that will do this transition possible because we talk about how this will be possible and uh, um, my my concern is related to the way this ambition will be translated into the real life of businesses which uh, in many times show a, a very basic level of, of understanding the practic in terms of practicalities of these topics there are many companies that only now learn about their environmental impact or their social impact and uh, on the other hand, they soon will need to, uh, to look at their emissions 
uh, and not just direct emissions, scope one, scope two emissions, but also scope three emissions. And for uh, many, many companies, these are new, new aspects they need to implement in their in their uh, in their job. Uh, Pascal earlier said that uh, uh, business as usual is no longer possible, and I fully agree. But on the same side, we should not underestimate the, the power of business as usual and the resistance to change. And one aspect that makes this uh, resistance drop would be how clear it is for people in the companies uh, to actually take these uh, ambitious goals and translate them into to-do actions of day to day. One direction, one line of action could be provided by the new set of uh, reporting requirements, non-financial reporting requirements or disclosure requirements, the ones we already have here in Europe uh, generated by the directive uh, from back in 2014 did not provide the, the expected result, but hopefully the package coming up next year will provide this result, will provide a, a tool for managers, for people in companies to actually understand their impact uh, and use this as a as a management tool, not just a reporting reporting tool that they will need to comply. And maybe if this package of uh, non-financial reporting will be uh, generally adopted, managers and companies in general will be able not just to uh, put themselves on the right path. Uh, to reach these ambitions of the uh, Fit for 55 package, but also with the SDGs and uh, their social impact, and also find the instruments and tools to uh, not project all the cost of the transition on their consumers, on their customers, because it was mentioned uh, several times here today, the importance of uh, social acceptance of this package. And I believe the one way of uh, bringing this social acceptance would be to provide managers with the right tools, with the right instruments to uh, keep in touch with their stakeholders, measure their real influence and their impact, and not just uh, in terms of how this would be or would be not uh, good investments, but also how the, uh, these measures would uh, would actually give uh, benefits to everyone involved. Thank you, Dario. I'm going to move us on quickly to our, our next respondent. So we're very pleased to be joined by Peter Vitek, uh, who is chairman of the supervisory board of Change for the Better in the Czech Republic. Uh, I hope you guessed it. The previous Green Growth uh, Partnership Fence. Peter, very happy to have you and um, interested in your thoughts on the, on the discussion. Thank you, Elliot. And good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to share a couple of notes from the Czech perspective and the perspective of a part of the private sector that I represent today. The Czech Republic is apparently off track to reach the Fit for 55 targets and not really ready to transform the economy in time due to several reasons. First, in a striking contrast to countries such as Austria or Germany, Czechs are deeply politically divided, and there is a total lack of an overarching social agreement that net zero is our shared goal of paramount importance. And in fact, we as a country seem not to really mean the net zero transition or understand fully what really needs to be done. Second, the business case for sustainable transformation of individual private companies is really a weak one. Many companies, especially those that are not that well connected to global, global supply chains, struggle to factor in the benefits of such a transition when they're creating business cases for investment or decision, uh, business decisions. And in fact, sustainability is still widely perceived here uh, as a cost rather than a benefit. In other words, uh, most companies still believe in the business as usual scenario as was discussed earlier today. And third, uh, as already discussed again, uh, widening social division on, uh, in our country. So while we've been slow and reluctant adopters uh, of sustainability measures in Czechia, 
but we will eventually adopt regulation incentives and initiatives such as the EU taxonomy. And in fact, more and more businesses, actors, business actors accept er, and even welcome that we need to price in the cost of carbon to create real business opportunities for sustainable business practitioners. But before new measures of the Fit 455 package are imposed, we need to get much better at discussing openly with various actors about the Fit 455, carbon tax, different forms of business self-regulation, et cetera. And that can't really be done without policymakers listening to progressive businesses. So that was my two cents, and I'm handing over back to you, Elliot. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for that, that excellent contribution. So um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Annette and Anika back to uh, have a very quick um, discussion. Basically, I, I think um, uh, you both made some, some really good points. Um, maybe Annette, if I start with you, picking up particularly off the points that Dori was making, but also going back to the start of the conversation with Sharon. I think one of the themes when we talk about business action is around accountability and transparency. Um, and I think that those points are, 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 are kind of well made. You know, you represent a company that has set out, as you, as you set out very clearly, good, strong ambition on this agenda. You want to show leadership. What do you see as the, how do you see it, the um, importance of being able to be held accountable for, for that kind of agenda? Oh, uh, well, good and big question. And I'll see if I can do it shortly. Um, this has been at the heart of, of the corporate sustainability movement from the beginning, being accountable. And, and uh, whether you are being held to account by NGOs or by your employees or by your board or by regulators, it's all about accountability and different measures to, to, to have that done. Uh, I think that's uh, super important in a, in a democracy um, and, um, and that we are having very transparent measures so that we can um, create trust in what we do and, and that um, we can have the figures, the data, the information available so that we can all make the right decisions. So, so different ways of doing it, but uh, obviously a key um, transparency is key to moving uh, the transition in the right direction, and I think that remains uh, even where we are today. Excellent. And Annika, you talked a lot in your, in your contribution around um, the the kind of progress and the leadership impact that Sweden is showing in terms of innovating the industrial sectors. And we've had some questions around the role of industry in terms of decarbonising. But given given there's been quite a lot of focus in this discussion around what does it mean for people, the social implications of change. How do you, you know? What do you see as the as the opportunities for economic recovery that that industrial change is, is might create? Thank you. Uh, well, I I do believe that there is uh, an opportunity in creating green new jobs and a solid business case in doing this uh, transition for for the business sector. But I think it also um, requires that we have a close dialogue with the private sector and and uh, a dialogue between. Uh, the private sector and, and policymakers uh, to ensure that this transition is predictable and also in doing that we can ensure that the transition of the wor workforce is done in a, in a just way. And uh, I would like to share an example from Sweden where we have uh, uh, the government have, have, have initiated an, an initiative called Fossil Free Sweden which is um, a platform from which we work very closely with the private sector and civil society to, to plan for a transition so that the business sectors, 13 business sectors in Sweden now have come up with their own roadmaps on how to become fossil free by 2045. And this helps companies themselves to make long term plans for transitioning the workforce. And it also provides the policymakers with um, information on where are the barriers, where are the obstacles, and how can we support this transition in, in various ways. And uh, for example, in, when it comes to the heavy industry, we have the government have, have uh, um, uh, started a venture industrial leap, which is uh, 
uh, a funding for the heavy industry in uh, doing this transition and doing investments in techni technologi technological uh, steps that are uh, also connected with an uh, economical risk. Uh, so uh, this is how we can support in do while business is doing their transition. But I think this dialogue is, is really key and uh, also for the business sectors for themselves to make their own plans and for themselves to, to define what are the barriers and how can how can policymakers help. Absolutely and I think that, that's a great note to kind of almost bring this this whole round of conversation together this, this note about business and government collaboration which is at the heart of the Green Growth Partnership. Um, so thank you both for, for your contribution and for, for taking those questions. I want to I wanted to ask Carol to rejoin us um, as our um, as a sort of a host and, and minister essentially. Um, obviously, you're going into uh, tomorrow. You're going into the the Environment Council discussion, um, and so I wondered if I could ask you just to kind of reflect on what you've heard in this discussion today. What you think in terms of the future of this conversation? Whether you have any kind of other concluding remarks you'd like to to draw things together with. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I would uh, like first of all to to thank all the in, uh, the panelists um, because what I hear today is from all sides of this panel, from, from uh, political uh, actors, our um, civil society actors, a big push towards ambition, towards uh, solution-oriented and sustainable solution and really the need to stick not only to, to 1.5, but the need to put in place a package that is fit for future. And I guess that's what we are all talking about, whether if we come from economies, from civil society or politics. The aim is what we share, is to have a society with a just transition and to stay competitive for the challenges of the future. So uh, this gives me a lot of hope that the discussion around this Fit for 55 package will uh, be, yes, of course, there will be a lot of discussions. But on the other hand, I uh, really appreciate the engagement I see in this round of discussion uh, in all different sectors, be it LULICF, where we have to work, or uh, all the other sectors of this, of this package. So thank you so much, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, for for everyone sharing this thoughts and for the discussions to comment. I think uh, the latest, stay in contact and really discuss the details for us as politicians is one of the most valuable things and I think that, that this is what we do in this group uh, that, uh, during the last years, uh, uh, really a good exchange between all kinds of actors. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That's That's great. So um, with that, I think we're going to bring to an end our conversation on the Fit for 55 package, which I would almost prefer if it was called the Fit for 2030 package, because it would, I would find it personally much easier to say. Um, we will um, reconvene in about three minutes, so at five past four European time, or a five minute break, um, to talk about COP26, so with a new set of panellists. But I want to thank everyone who's contributed to the conversation so far. You've been um, great, lots of really fascinating input and thank you for your time and energy and uh, do stay in touch just as Carol says let's let's keep this conversation going thank you everyone okay welcome back um hopefully that's been enough time to just catch your breath get a drink of water or whatever else you need to do um so I'm very pleased that we're carrying on with the green growth summit 2021 um, with uh, our second session, um, a, dis a focused discussion on the road to COP26 and how Europe, how the EU can contribute towards a successful outcome at COP26. Um, again, we've got um, uh, uh, two rounds of great contributors um, and, and should be a really good engaging discussion. So let me bring those, those, those people on board and let's start this conversation going. So I'm very pleased to welcome our first uh, contributor, which is Matt Toombs. Um, who is the Director of Partnerships and Engagement from the UK Government's COP26 unit, so the, the um, COP Presidency designate team. Um, so Matt, if you can uh, uh, put your video on and join us and then 
um, it would be great to hear from you in terms of your thoughts on on uh, our, this imminent event and opportunity to kind of drive forward global ambition on climate change. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Elliot. Checking that this is all working well. Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Well, it's um, it's great to be here and to be here with so many colleagues that we've been working really closely with in the lead up to COP26. Um, I mean, this this is the, the critical moment. It's less than four weeks to go. Um, and uh, there's been a, a very strong focus over the recent week. So uh, last week, our Italian partners um, hosted the pre-COP in Milan. Um, and that really got into the uh, negotiated issues that we are going to need to resolve when we um, uh, when we get to Glasgow at the start of November. It showed the things that need resolving, but it also showed that there's still a lot of work needed to uh, get to a negotiated agreement. Um, also really powerful last week was the voice of young people um, at the Youth for Climate event uh, that was held alongside the pre-COP. Um, and that showed the expectations that young people have of world leaders, of governments, cities, businesses to deliver um, at Glasgow. Uh, and the responsibility that um, that uh, we all bring. Um, the presidency has um, for COP26. We've been very focused on um, on delivering, firstly, on one and a half degrees, so keeping one and a half degrees alive and the pathway to one and a half degrees alive. And we've been focused on finance and adaptation and on a negotiated outcome. Um, and to keep one and a half degrees alive. Um, I think, as as many of you know, this this requires action at a number of different levels. Um, it requires uh, the commitments that are needed at a country level by 2030 to keep in uh, in reach uh, the halving of global emissions, and, and that's through each country coming forward with updated, ambitious, uh, nationally determined contributions. Um, that's the, the critical element of the Paris uh, mechanism and ratchet framework that, that we need to show that this works. Um, and Glasgow is the moment for showing that. Uh, we need all countries to set mid-century uh, net zero targets, but we also really need that progress on sectoral transitions. You'll have heard the, the um, Prime Minister of the UK talking about cash, cars, coal and trees. Uh, and this is a real focus for us as presidency. So it, phasing out coal, um, by 2030 in developed countries, 2040 in developing countries, tackling deforestation and, uh, and accelerating the transition to sustainable agriculture and moving to 100% zero emission vehicles. Um, as presidency, we have also been very focused on finance and delivering the 100 billion goal promise to developing countries um, and showing the support for adaptation around uh, loss and damage, access to finance and other related questions. Um, so we have seen progress over the recent uh, over recent months. We've seen the G7 uh, making progress against the one and a half degree targets commitment by each uh, G7 uh, country towards uh, emission reduction targets in line with uh, one and a half degrees. Um, and more recently at UNGA, the progress on the 100 billion with the US um, committing to double their climate finance uh, and uh, President Xi committing not to build a new coal-fired um, power projects but I think as we all know there is still a very long way to go uh, and the NDC synthesis report from the UNFCCC showed that. Um, and so the, U, the EU, I know you've had a long discussion on the Fit for 55 package, the EU is a really close partner to the UK on COP26 and our wider climate finance, uh, climate priorities um, and Fit for 55 is a really powerful package showing that. Um, and the, the finance that several member states have brought forward um, have also um, strongly supported the work towards COP. Um, and we really need the, the EU's continuing support in, in working with those G20 countries uh, where we still need to see more in, enhanced NDCs, um, stronger net zero uh, long term strategies, and then crucially the commitments on uh, on coal, on deforestation, on transport, and the critical sectoral transitions that we need. Um, but also business is, is really essential and it's fantastic to have um, other business colleagues here on this, uh, on this panel um, and we mean business um, colleagues as well. Um, and we really need the, the energy of the private sector on our side to, to show that um, the commitments made in Paris are deliverable in Glasgow, we can uh, show the pathways needed to keep one and a half degrees alive. 
Uh, and we're asking all businesses to take immediate action to uh, join the race to zero if they haven't already and the race to resilience. Um, and we're asking business to collaborate across their sectors with their peers to accelerate the transition and critically to work with governments. Um, so many businesses have connections and work closely with governments across the world um, and to encourage those governments to make bold commitments uh, and to commit to ambitious paths. Uh, and fantastically, more than 500 businesses have uh, made this call to the G20 in a recent open letter by the We Mean Business Coalition, which, um, which we very, very strongly support. Uh, please do sign up to this. So we're, we're in the four, final four weeks. Um, my, my call, kind of working from the presidency team, would be, please, could you all look at what extra commitments your organisation or your countries can make? And then how you can continue to work with other um, major emitters and wider sectors that you're involved in to lock in the overall level of ambition we need um, to keep one and a half degrees alive as we uh, follow on these final few weeks running through to Glasgow. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I'll pass back to you. Thank you so much, Matt. And um, uh, stirring final message there, the, you know, the clock is very much ticking to, to get those new commitments in that step up in terms of ambition. So do stay, stay with us. But I mean, if you'll um, if you want to turn your video off, and we'll we'll invite our next speaker, our next contributor into this this conversation. So Matt talked about the interrelationship, in fact, with our, our previous conversation around the Fit 55 package and this. So it's great to have a contributor talking about European ambition, European contribution to this conversation. So we have Demetrius Sevkolis, um, Deputy Head of the Unit for International and Mainstreaming and Policy Coordination at the European Commission. Demetrius, over to you. Hello to all, thank you for having me here. Uh, indeed, um, I would like to share with you some of our priorities regarding uh, COP26. I think I'm going to sound a bit redundant because already what we hear from Matt is really a representation of the things, that, of the key messages that I would like to pass uh, in, in this panel. So from, from our side, from the EU side, indeed the COP26 will, will need to have an outcome that will address the following three subjects. So number one is that we need to maintain the 1.5 degrees within reach in this decade. So we need an outcome that will present how we're going to do that. Secondly, we need to have an outcome that will show that we are ready to strengthen our action to adapt to climate change. And we already heard from Matt and other speakers about, the, about this topic, and I will say a few words about this. And third, we need to demonstrate our solidarity to the developing countries that are the most affected by climate change and build momentum for aligning financial flows with the Paris goals. So, regarding the first subject, how we, how we can use the COP in order to maintain the 1.5 degree target within reach? First, we need to highlight that the science tells us that we are already there. The 1.5 actually is going to be reached pretty soon. And the question is how we can avoid uh, to a permanent situation, something that will go beyond 1.5. So we need to, up to the state of the climate system. Also, we need uh, the parties to show through the COP26 outcome that they commit to the significant enhancement of their efforts within this decade, which means that they have to present their long-term strategies and they have to present their uh, national determined contributions, their enhanced national determined con contributions as, you, as, uh, as soon as possible. So we need to remain focused with, uh, through the COP26 outcome to reduce emissions in this decade. Now, uh, we also need to recognize the different sectors. Uh, we heard from, uh, from Matt about the sectoral initiatives, and it did. The policy campaigns by the UK COP26 presidency, but also through the G7 uh, uh, chairmanship, we saw that there have been quite instrumental in, in showing that we can uh, we can uh, reduce emissions in the different sectors. So we need the the COP26 to give visibility to all these initiatives and to the specific commitments that can keep uh, 1.5 degrees uh, within reach. And finally. Uh, we should not forget that we need also a rule book that will show that uh, we can uh, we can uh, get this ambition. So we need an ambitious framework of rules, including on transparency, including on uh, Article 6, 
that uh, that show that the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement by all parties is is possible in in the next decade. Now let me address the second part uh, when it comes to adaptation. So when it comes to adaptation, we need an outcome that will communicate that. Uh, will present a call for all the parties to communicate how they are stepping up their respective adaptation actions as part of a, of a wider call to all parties for higher ambition. We know that uh, our developing country partners are asking for, for a sense of balance in the treatment of mitigation and adaptation. And indeed, we understand this key concern and we agree that uh, we need to provide greater priority to supporting climate action, uh, adaptation action and to address loss and damage as well. So support should respond to developing country priorities tailored to their needs that continue to evolve, and especially towards those that are the most vulnerable, the poorest uh, countries. Now, I can say what the EU has done for that. Of course, we have uh, developed an adaptation strategy and we are ready to communicate uh, our adaptation uh, uh, action uh, through the adaptation communication that we will submit uh, to the UNFCCC in the next days. It's, it's going to be one of the subjects uh, of the Environment Council tomorrow. So we are already doing a lot in, the, in this field and I don't need to repeat what we are doing on the 1.5. You already mentioned the Fit for 55 packets and the climate law. So we are committed to, to do all this and we are committed to provide more sustained and increased investment in enhancing resilience and adaptation in the most disaster prone countries and those regions in order to encourage the build back better strategies for recovery after the disasters. Now, finally, on, on climate finance. Uh, we all know about the report from the OECD that shows that there was a shortfall in 2019 and because of the COVID, uh, the COVID crisis, we can expect that uh, there might be some shortfall in 2020 as well. Now, what would the, the donor countries need to do is to recognize this shortfall. And I think that in the pre cop from uh, what we heard last week, uh, we heard all the donor countries really recognizing this, this shortfall in the delivery of the $100 billion call. So a delivery plan is, uh, is under preparation and will be presented in the coming days. So we expect that the, the COP26 will demonstrate this strong commitment by the developed countries to address this shortfall. From our side, already the Commission and some member states have presented enhanced public finance commitments for the coming years. And we expect that these commitments, combined with policies that help to align financial flows with the Paris goals, will help to address the shortfall. Moreover, we need to see how the subject of aligning financial flows globally will be covered by the COP outcome. So the ministerial discussions that will happen on finance that will happen during the COP, as well as the initiation of the deliberations regarding the post-2025 call, are very important opportunities to demonstrate the, the ambition that, that ambition will come with broader mobilization of private finance, as well as with conducive policies and actions by all, not only by the developed countries, but also from the developing countries that are the recipients of climate finance. So this is a small overview of, uh, of our approach towards uh, this uh, towards this COP. I think that uh, you will get, uh, let's say, a full-fledged uh, approach of uh, the EU position in the Council conclusions that uh, will be adopted tomorrow. Uh, and I should remind that uh, today the ECOFIN, uh, the ECOFIN Council, has adopted uh, Council conclusions on, uh, on climate finance. So there you can see a full uh, fledged uh, delivery of our positions. Back to you. Thank you, Demetrius. Thank you. That, that, that very full and uh, illuminating overview of the of European positions and highlighting the kind of key role of, of the upcoming European Council discussions. So next up we have uh, Matthias Fischer, um, who is State Secretary for the um, uh, Ministry of Environment and Climate in Norway. Uh, Matthias, over to you. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you all for uh, interesting discuss the discussions uh, for the last couple of hours. Uh, I'll start by echoing the, the two previous speakers. I think that a successful COP in uh, Glasgow is a COP that keeps 1.5 alive. It's clear do, the science is clear now that 1.5 cannot be a, a hope, uh, some broader ambition. It has, it is now a necessity, and the policy needs to follow that science. Uh, I think 
it will be interesting to look back now to, to the Paris Agreement and see, uh, because Paris gave people hope. Paris made the world think that now we can uh, combat cu climate change. And in a way, that hope was uh, not completely deserved, if we should be honest. Because at that time, in 2015, the sum of the national ambitions uh, in the national targets was far from enough to achieve neither 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. But what generated hope in Paris was that uh, we admitted as uh, countries and parties to the agreement that we knew that this was not enough and we will update our NDCs. Or in AA uh, terms, we admitted we had a problem, which should always be step one. And we said that we were going to fix it by enhancing our NDCs. And six years later, uh, the NDCs are still not enough. Uh, so now we, the parties to, to this uh, agreement, risk being the drunk driver who got arrested twice. And then at that time, it is harder to build trust and uh, be forgiven for, from your family. And that makes it harder for these countries, for all of us now to gen generate hope after Glasgow. But I think it is possible. Uh, first of all, you need to be clear that we are going to change. We need to enhance our NDCs. Many countries still haven't done so, and the NDCs have to be uh, more ambitious than they are today. We need to be clear on how we are going to change. That means clear climate action plans from all countries. And we need to uh, submit to a system which, which means finalizing the rulebook from the Paris Agreement. But most of all, we really need to show the world that we are willing to do what it takes to get to, the, to achieve the goal of 1.5. I believe that this is possible because we cannot leave Glasgow in a way that leaves the world believing that uh, this is but where we are today is the most ambitious uh, we can be, that this is the most the countries of the world is willing to do. So how do we do that? I think that Europeans, European countries and the EU is leading by example. And the Hit for 55 is an inspiration for a lot of people, uh, a lot of governments and a lot of businesses to see that it is possible to achieve ambitious goals on climate. And I think the key is that the European and the EU's climate uh, and Fit for 55 uh, combines the ambitious goal. It concretes it with a concrete plan. Uh, it has the clear social element. And especially in this form, I would underline, it is uh, policies for growth that makes European businesses part of the solution and not a problem. So Norway, as part of the EA uh, agreement with the EU, welcomes the Fit for 55 and the European Green Deal. Uh, and I think that EU now shows that its NDC is more than just a number. It is a vision for a European future for the coming 10 uh, years. And last week I was in Milan for the pre-cup. I think it's clear that there is a lot of work to do and uh, a lot of discussions yet to be held. Um, we will continue to push for continuing uh, enhanced NDCs and we have an enhanced uh, financial uh, commitments from the parties. And we need to push for NDCs that are in line with 1.5. Uh, but we need to show that uh, combating climate change is not merely a burden, it is also an opportunity. And we need to show that to, to the world that it is now a race for businesses um, on competing for being the first on new technology, being uh, that, that that business race is a part of the climate policies that we are running. And that's where I think the EU, uh, European Union can truly make a difference in showing that this is full of opportunities for the years to come. So we lead by uh, example and inspire both businesses and other countries. That should be an important part of that work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. And, and you know, great, great themes there. I think there's there's a really strong message about moving from, from the first step to the next step, moving from ambition to action and leading by example that is is really valuable. I'm going to move this on to our, our next speaker. So Hitte uh, Gutterland um, uh, from, the, from the European Parliament. We've had a had a, a national voice, we've had a European Commission voice, um, but it's great to have a parliamentary voice. Um, Jutta, I wonder if you can turn your screen on and join us. 
much. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to participate at this uh, important webinar. And um, I, I would like to start uh, by saying that I think it's extremely timely and uh, very valuable to be able to access the, and address the Green Growth Summit. And I want to start by expressing, expressing how welcome it is to, that the progressives around the public and private sector are joining forces uh, as in the Green Growth Partnership. Policymakers need to send the clear signals and provide the market's conditions for action, but also collaborate uh, closely with business in ensuring that action is taken. And I mean, it is taken. Projects like Hybrid, Northwald in the northern Sweden, I'm coming from Sweden, so I know about it. They are now pr producing fossil free steel. And in the last legislature in the European Parliament, that would have been like rock science to, to talk about uh, projects like that, uh, almost impossible. But uh, uh, we also have Northwalt, who is uh, uh, producing carbon neutral iron and batteries. And all this would not have happened a couple of years back, as I uh, mentioned. And it would not have happened by themselves. It was important to have collaboration between actors to make it happen. It was also interesting to hear the previous speakers on COP26 and it gave at least some hope for me ahead of the conference. The timing of COP26 could not actually have been better. With the EU having adopted the European climate law, sharply increasing the ambitions, but also now started with the climate package turning this into action via the sectorial legislation. And also with President Biden back in the White House showing leadership that we would not even dream to see in the last legislature. And together with the European Union, the United States are now willing to really be one of the big actors at COP26. And also with China now taking steps toward carbon neutrality, at least by 2060, this is also important in front of this COP26. Yet, we are already seeing how emissions start to rise again after the COVID crisis and that the world has not to reconsider the direction of the future. Despite increased ambition in the pledge, that still only adds up to 3.2 degrees of global heating. And it's far from enough uh, if uh, this is the, t the action that we already taken. It's far from enough. With pledges, um, it is, of course, uh, the center of the di discussion in the Glasgow, but we also need to turn the discussion from pledges to action. We need to discuss more closely and concretely what action the parties need to take to turn this around. The message from the European Parliament is very clear. We live in crisis in the climate crisis and we need to treat this as an emergency. We are about to take our mandate ahead of the COP26 and I will be a delegate also to Glasgow and I will pass the message of increased ambition forward. I know that we are discussing now the resolution that we are voting on the uh, now in October in front of Glasgow. There are many things to be discussed in Glasgow. Issues like climate finance, um, on what the next target will be ahead. And hopefully we will <clears throat> have enough pressure to ensure the existing target on 100 billion US dollar that that is achieved. The Paris Agreement rule, books, rule book needs to be uh, completed where COP25 failed to deliver. And this includes carbon dioxide credits, financing for loss and damage, and the role of nature-based solutions. We need to stop all double counting and make sure that maritime and av aviation emissions um, don't fall through the cracks. And of course, every country 
must update and raise the ambitions on their NDCs in line with the Paris Agreement. Countries like Brazil, Australia, Russia, for example. But ach uh, achieving progress on all these issues will not be enough for me to be convinced that we will actually achieve our own um, targets. What I really want to see in Glasgow is detailed and concrete proposals on how parties are planning to get there, to reach their NDCs. Which countries are willing to stop subsidies fuels, um, fossil fuels? Which countries are willing to put halt on construction on new, new fossil fuel infrastructure, such as coal plants? Which countries are willing to commit to leaving their reserves of coal, oil and natural gas in the ground? And which countries outside the European Union are ready to implement their own emission trading schemes? A couple of important questions that should be raised to all the actors going to COP26. If not the conference itself, I hope world leaders will go home afterwards and start the work on brave and ambitious reforms that will actually make a difference. When leaders start walking in a direction, start showing their commitments above what is already popular, you start to see movements everywhere in the society. The business community hates uncertainty. We need leaders that send clear signals where we are heading, that create new momentum in this green transition. Thank you. Thank you, Jitta. Here, here. Um, yeah, some great points made there and a very clear call to action. Um, without too much further ado, I want to move us on to uh, uh, the next contribution here is uh, we've got a business speaker, member of uh, CLG Europe and CLG UK. So Keith Anderson, the Chief Executive Officer of Scottish Power, which is part of the Bidrola Group. Um, Keith, if you can join us and share your thoughts and also I suppose Scottish Power as a, one of the sponsors of um, COP26. So kind of key, key link there. Um, Keith, it'd be great to have your thoughts on this moment, this opportunity that, that lies ahead of us. Good, thanks, Elliot. I hope you can uh, you can hear me fine. Good. So, um, thank you for the for the opportunity to speak to, you and it's been really interesting listening to the the previous speakers. And and I'll pick up maybe on one or two of the themes that Matt in particular talked about, which was the sort of important interaction between uh, business and the policymakers and and governments in terms of trying to achieve and make a successful COP. As an organisation, we been, I suppose, on a sort of 20, 25 year strategy of turning ourselves green uh, at Scottish Power. And you know, during that process, we've shut down all of our coal plant, we've sold off all of our gas plant, and we are now a 100% renewable uh, energy generating company from onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, and solar uh, power as well. Um, and we kind of like to talk about that and, and, and use it as an example to show that it can be done. Uh, in doing that, um, we, we didn't just shut down our coal plant, we actually shut down all of the coal plant in Scotland as a country. Uh, and so we made a massive contribution to shifting the whole country uh, further towards its net zero ambition as well. Um, and I think just now as an organisation, we're so focused on net zero and so focused on the commercial opportunity, the business opportunity, as well as the environmental opportunity, that actually everything we do as an organisation, we now do through the prism of, of net zero. And all of the strategic decisions we're making are through the prism of, of net zero and getting to net zero. Um, and the green, you know, people talk about a green recovery and an economic recovery. And I think this is, you know, it's one of the most important things in terms of using that as a powerful message to get other countries and other businesses bought into to the future uh, of tackling climate change and bought into getting the right targets and the right outcome from, from COP26. Um, we you know, can clearly track the success of our company, uh, the valuation of our company, um, the performance of our company, uh, alongside that journey of getting to getting to net zero and going to 100% green, and there's a very clear co correlation for us. And we now look at the opportunity ahead of us, uh, particularly in the UK, but but you know, for the whole group worldwide, at being part of a huge economic recovery in terms of investment in critical infrastructure, 
um, investment directly in renewables projects and grid and the distribution system, investment now into the transport network, into the heat network, uh, into the creation of a hydrogen network. And on the back of that, because of the size and scale of the infrastructure, we will deliver benefit right across every community in the country. We'll deliver benefit in terms of skills, jobs, training opportunities, supply chain opportunities, manufacturing opportunities. And that shows you the strength that actually a, an infrastructure-led green recovery can bring to any economy in any country. And if you do this and structure it properly, if you have the correct mechanisms in place as a country, if you do the correct incentive mechanisms as well, um, you will get the investment flowing in and you'll get the economic benefit and the economic growth on the back of tackling climate change as well. You know, and I think today, now, the sort of economic case and the environmental case are truly absolutely 100% aligned. And I think that's a really powerful place for us to be. And it's a really powerful thing for business to take a lead on showing that and demonstrating that and driving that forward. Um, it's also about, you know, and Matt touched on this, about you know, who you work with across your own sector, but also into other sectors. And that's something we've been trying to push very, very hard. So we're now working with Shell, a you know, big oil and gas company, obviously, but we're going to work with them on the future and bidding for the future of, of um, offshore wind in the UK. And again, we think that's a really important thing to do. Um, this isn't about uh, lambasting other sectors or criticising other sectors. It's about working with them, getting them involved, and actually helping them map out and uh, the, their transition and their strategy uh, for also getting to net zero and for decarbonisation. We're doing the same with other industrial users of power uh, through the work we're trying to do with the, the creation of a green hydrogen economy and looking at you know, working with distilleries, other heavy industry users, and how we can help them decarbonise uh, and show a pathway to net zero as well. As I look at the future and we look at innovation again and link that to recovery and link it to getting to net zero, you know, our whole um, agenda, our whole uh, business environment just says innovation, innovation, innovation. And again, that creates a lot of opportunity for the future, whether that's innovation in hydrogen, whether it's in transport, whether it's in heat, whether it's in battery technology, whether it's in storage, whether it's in smart grids. It's just more and more innovation. And again, where you see uh, the opportunity for all of that innovation, it creates a big business opportunity and a big commercial opportunity. And I think, again, that's a really important message. It's a message not only do we want to deliver to other companies, but a message that we deliver to governments, to politicians, to regulators around the world, which is don't look at this you know, as some kind of burden and just some kind of challenge but also look at it as an opportunity and look at the benefit you can bring economically um, to the whole of your country yeah, and to the future of your market. So for us, COP26, we're a principal partner, a big sponsor. Why? And we wanted to get involved because we want to use COP26 as a way of demonstrating from a business perspective, here's how you can help drive forward the agenda. Here's how you can set your own agenda. Here's how you can use innovation. Here's how you can get economic benefit. Here's how you can deliver a better future quicker for your company, for the citizens of the country, for the environment, for everyone. And I think the COP coming to Glasgow, which is our hometown in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, again, the benefits that, that can bring in terms of showing what we've done, how we can do it, the innovation we've got going in the country, the economic development of the country, the skill sets that we have to offer as a country, and look at how you can start to export that around the world as well, I think makes the COP26 an incredibly powerful platform uh, for the future of tackling climate change, for the future of getting to net zero, and for business to really show that it can take a lead and it can show the way for, for, for countries right around the world. So that's me, Elliot. Thanks. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, uh, wise words, and also I'm, I'm just to kind of give you kudos for. I, I realise you must have an excellent collection of green ties, as uh, both on the slide and in real life, you've got a you've got a fine specimen um, to display. So uh, I, there's definitely a lesson I can learn there. 
Um, I, I think, I, I don't know if you can stay with us or I think you might have to leave, um, but we're going to move on to um, one or two quick questions to the panel. Um, so if you, if you do have to leave, feel free to, but if you can stick around. I, I, I could stay for two or three more minutes, okay, just for questions. Okay. So I invite any of the speakers who have, who have already um, contributed um, in this discussion on COP26 to rejoin us for this, uh, this panel. And I guess the first question, which um, I want to sort of maybe aim at Matt and Keith, so maybe Matt first and then Keith, is, is um, a question that came from, from a business in the audience. But so um, it's about the, the COP itself um, and it's about the opportunities for business to take part in the dialogue, in the, in the conversation, particularly businesses who are part of the Road to Zero have, have SBTI targets. So they, they've, they've done their homework, they've got a good story to tell. How can they be, how can they support the event? How can they be part of, of the dialogue? Matt, Matt first, but Keith, I know you're you're based um, out of Glasgow, so you, you may well have have some thoughts about the events and activities happening there. Brilliant, thanks, Elia. And uh, so, I mean, I'd start by start by saying that um, it's fantastic for those businesses who have committed to Race to Zero. So, you know, the first thing is to make those commitments and then follow through with the with the action that's needed. Um, in uh, within the blue zone and the green zone, green zone there will be a, a number of opportunities for businesses to uh, showcase, be part of conversations, discussions uh, that will be taking place through COP. There are kind of different zones in the blue zone. There's part of the blue zone will be managed by uh, the high level action champions. Um, so Nigel Topping, Gonzalo Munoz. Um, there'll be a space called the action zone, which a number of businesses will participate in. There are a number of pavilions within the blue zone that are managed by different businesses and business organizations. Uh, and there'll be a number of, number of presidency events where we are including um, some leading climate um, businesses to contribute to discussions. So I think, you know, the first thing is that, that it is really important business has a voice within this, but particularly those leading businesses, as Keith said, you know, with, with Scottish Power, those who've had, you know, the experience, the track record and who are showing the, you know, future future plans that, um, you know, that, that can help kind of uh, drive that message of the opportunity and the, the economic possibility that uh, climate transitions brings. I think uh, just to, to, to add on to that, uh, Ellie, just to pick up on what Matt said, look, you know, that there's a whole load of official stuff going on at the COP, at the COP uh, centre, um, uh, whether it's in the blue zone and the green zone, and you know, there's, um, I think there are websites and portals where you can go and find out what, what exactly is going on and what days and when and what you can get access to. But there's a massive amount of other activity planned around the city um, from companies like us. So look, look, feel free to get in touch with me directly if you want to find out what we're doing. Uh, we're running a whole series of events. Um, our, our head office and our auditorium is literally a stone's throw away from the COP centre. Uh, we're working with organisations like WWF, with some of the universities, uh, with CBI Scotland. So we're putting on events, we're putting on joint events. Um, contact me, contact the CBI. Um, the, the CBI have got um, access to a whole lot of events that they're putting on, but also the CBI have also got a website and a portal about how business can get involved and what business can do to contribute. So there's loads and loads of information out there. Glasgow City Council are putting stuff on, Strathclyde Uni are putting stuff on, Glasgow Uni are putting stuff on. Just, yeah, tons of opportunity to get involved. But please shout, shout, uh, ping me an email and um, I'll put you in touch with people. You may regret that offer, but um, and I would say, you know, so CISL, the Corporate Leaders Group, will have things on our website shortly, um, which will uh, outline many of the events that we're organised in. I know Women Business will also act as a bit of a conduit, and we'll hear from Sophie later. So I think the message, the overall message is, is there's going to be a lot of stuff happening, which is which is good, particularly in the in the current context, and and I, I predict lots of useful dialogues very much like this one. So hopefully we can we can build on this example. So I'm going to give one last question, which I will take sort of one or two responses. It's a very open general question. I feel like one of the themes that I've heard, um, particularly in, in the round of contributions, is the value of examples. You know, Europe, the UK setting an example in terms of what it can do, business setting an example in terms of what it can do to inspire further action. I don't know if any of the any of you have any thoughts in terms of what you see as sort of some of the critical or most important stories or examples that could that need to be set in this moment and maybe if you just want to either catch my eye or raise a hand if you feel like you've got something to contribute on that one 
Matt, Matthias. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think in this form, I think it's good to see, look at the business, the businesses itself. Uh, you, you have countries that do a lot of good on climate and serve as example and inspiration for others. But I think when you see companies uh, taking action to cut their own emissions or uh, or uh, lead by developing new technology and, and when you see more and more people assuming in finance and in business that we are going to achieve our climate goals when more people are talking like that is where this uh, world is headed that's when you really in inspire because people will think we're missing out on something so the more businesses that take this seriously believe in net zero the more other people who might not care that much about climate change they will see that some smart people are doing something on climate that i'm not doing and why are they doing that and we'll follow suit so everybody can lead by example, both politicians and uh, businesses alike. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some more speakers to, to bring into this this topic of COP26. So thank you all for your contributions. I'm gonna I'm gonna close the, the discussion there. Thank thank you for joining me, um, and move us on to to hear from our our next input. So um, I'm pleased to be joined by Kaya Tayo, um, who is the ambassador for climate and energy policy at large um, from Estonia. Kaya. Thank you so much. I was very happy to listen to uh, the previous panel and especially our Norwegian colleague who actually confirmed that uh, the European Union has been leading by example by Fit for 55. And we are rightly proud of it, which means that we don't only talk, but we also walk the walk. And this walk takes place ma mainly in between COP meetings. So slightly differently from the others i will actually focus more on what we do in between uh, my first point is that among other things largely since the previous cop meeting uh, the european union has sort of reinvented climate diplomacy our national governments represented by various ministers be them environment or trade or development or energy of course have been making the point for a long time but as we see uh, the global goals have stayed out of reach so since Ursula von der Leyen's commission uh, we have pulled our strengths and capacities uh, both in the institutions and also in the member states also in climate diplomacy uh, do we have results uh, COP26 will tell but at least the European Union has been more visible in a selected batch of, of countries all over the world. So we have talked the talk with Green Dimarches, but we have also provided some concrete advice with, with workshops and seminars. Some alliances and coalitions have been launched, like uh, Powering Past Coal Alliance. Others are in the making, like Global Methane, initiative or beyond oil and gas alliance and there is an informal climate ambassadors network uh, to support all this this is a small thing but certainly has improved the cooperation my second point is that even a small country like estonia can find its place in this global cooperation our flagship project in the un framework comes from UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program Corporation, and is called DEAL. Uh, it will support UNEP in its efforts to develop global environmental data strategy by 2025. So what's it about? Uh, we all know that to adapt efficiently and to mitigate the climate change effects, you need to base your efforts on sufficient and reliable data. And it is no secret that today data globally is neither always available, reliable or comparable. Not to speak about digital solutions or the know-how how to use data. So DEAL will be a coalition of state and non-state actors to improve national data management capacities across the globe. And we have actually already started with this. And at COP26, talking about examples, uh, 
uh, Estonia wants to wants to show that even with a very difficult starting position, uh, like us, where we were totally reliant on fossil fuels in 1990, transition to green options is doable. Our greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal for 2030 is 70%, so not 55 like the European Union. And we have already achieved 72% by 2020. And yes, digital solutions do play a role, although we don't turn a blind eye towards increasing energy needs and, and thus partly growing share of greenhouse gas emissions in the IT sector. But this sector is also a major source of solutions. So our strength lies in combining digital services with green targets and solutions. Uh, for example, smart cities or transportation or di digital methods in biodiversity conservation. So we want to share those experiences which we have with our startup companies, uh, which focus on, on solar energy or electric vehicles or sustainable consumption practices. We want to show how by digitalizing, for example, the energy sector, new climate neutral solutions can be easily taken up by consumers and producers alike. And, and they will contribute to storage, demand response, etc. So, lots to talk about. Let's go for a lively discussion at COP26. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. A uh, really key point about how the, the green transition and the digital transition absolutely must, must come together and they, and they must be put in absolute synergy. So, um, our next speaker I'm going to invite to join us is uh, Thomas Lingard. He is the Global Climate and Environment Director for Unilever. Um, and uh, an active, you know, supporter and member of uh, the corporate leaders group as well. Thomas, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Elia and um, Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership for inviting us here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, it's always hard when you come towards the end of such a great session to say something new and interesting. It's also hard doing this virtually that you can't read the energy level in the room. Um, but I just wanted to make a couple of really quick points. Um, uh, let me just introduce Unilever. You may know us. We're a large global consumer goods company working across um, uh, soaps, hygiene products, home care and food and refreshment. We've got a very strong uh, EU footprint, big businesses right across Europe. And we do try and do our best to show some leadership on climate change with science-based targets aligned to 1.5 degrees um, uh, and, and delivering that through our operations. We were proud to achieve a, a global target of 100% renewable grid electricity in 2020. We've got a, a, a target to be zero emission operations by 2030. We have a net zero target for our value chain by 2039. Um, and I would uh, humbly say, you know, within those targets, there are things that we know how to do and we're getting on and doing them. There are things we want to do, but we need a little bit of uh, help from the policy makers to make them economic. And there are still some things we don't know how to do. Uh, and we're working right through the value chain with partners to try and figure out the tricky stuff. Um, but we do think it's super important that everyone is working together on this, uh, the companies, the policymakers, the investors. Um, we were surprised, maybe that's the wrong way, word to say, but we, we took our climate transition action plan actually to our AGN this year um, to, to, to share what we were intending to do with our investors and put it up for a, a non-binding advisory vote. It passed with 99.59%. Uh, of the votes cast, an astonishing result, really. Uh, we expected it to pass, but not, not so unanimously. And I think it just shows the strength of feeling in the market in the private sector about how necessary this transition is uh, and how up uh, for doing it the, the whole private sector community is at this point. Um, so, um, you know, we've been really clear, as I said, that the, the, the stuff we're trying to get done can't be delivered without uh, big shifts uh, in the world. The three shifts I think we're talking about are a policy shift, uh, not so much little incremental shifts in ambition and targets, but really dramatic shifts in how we think about the role of policy in engineering, uh, you know, a once in a century uh, transition in the economy. Uh, we're thinking about an investment shift of how the money can, can flow that links to the policy shift. If the policy is there creating certainty for businesses, then the money will flow. There's no shortage of capital in the world. It's just not deployed right now in the right ways. 
Uh, and underpinning all of that, we think there's a mindset shift. Uh, and again, it's this moving out of incrementalism that you know has been the way of doing policy for the last, uh, well, forever really, and, and into a much more transformational mindset which requires everybody to think more holistically outside of silos, integrating the social, the economic uh, and the environmental together. Uh, and I think we find that the, you know, the just transition elements in a lot of the, uh, the conversations around the climate transition, uh, the net zero transition is still not always strong enough. Um, uh, EU is, I think, pretty good at this, but um, with, there's always more work to do in terms of thinking through as we move from targets to implementation, how do we put the people and communities that we all serve, whether as business owners or as uh, political leaders at the heart of, of what we're thinking about trying to do. Um, so look, it will come as uh, no surprise that Unilever is uh, super supportive of everything the EU's done to, to get this 55% uh, emissions reduction target. Um, uh, and I, you know, we should extend our thanks to those in the room uh, today who've worked really hard to get that through. It's been a you know, big effort by the community uh, to make that happen. Um, uh, but we've got to now see that translated into hard policy measures. Uh, it's the easy bit really is having the, is having the target and the hard bit is, is when the rubber hits the road uh, on things like carbon pricing, on where you set the renewable energy targets, uh, just transition measures to see coal phased out in the remaining places that we still have that, uh, and even repurposing agricultural subsidies so they really work to deliver uh, the Paris Agreement and not against it. So, um, so, you know, we love the target. It's a brilliant step in the right direction. Uh, I think if you run the numbers, Europe will need something more like a, a 58 to 70 percent reduction if it was to truly be in line with the Paris Agreement. So there's, you know, I think it's important that we hold on to that target and see it as a floor, not a ceiling of ambition, uh, whilst also grappling with the really, you know, tricky uh, policy measures that we'll need to, to implement it. So just a, a, a polite reminder there that, you know, there's always more to do on this on this subject. Um, but that's all I wanted to say by way of a few quick remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Excellent. And a, and a really important reminder about the, the fact that we should always look to go further. This is not an agenda that we should be under delivering on. Um, OK, so next up, I have Sophie Punt, um, who is Managing Director of Policy from the Women Business Coalition, a coalition that CLG Europe is a proud and active uh, founding partner of. Sophie, over to you. Well, thanks very much for Elliot for inviting me and for the Green Growth Group of Ministers for inviting me to this important event. Um, building on, on what Thomas just said, um, you can translate those shifts uh, for the EU to intervene at three levels, before the COP, during the COP and after the COP. And I'd like to give some suggestions from a business perspective to that. And the first one is about before the COP. Um, the G Summit is right before it on the 30th and 31st of October. And it's really important because G20 are the represent the biggest economies in the world and together represent 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever is achieved there can set the ground for COP and beyond. And what we have done as a Union Business Coalition, we coordinated an open letter that was signed by hundreds of, of companies that were looking for G20 leaders to go all in for 1.5. And to looking, if you're looking at the fundamentals of what's really at play, uh, there were three things that we highlighted in the letter. The first one is that the strengthening of the NDC. So now the Paris agreements have been set. We really need to get down to national plans and policies and making sure that those NDCs and their supporting policies and plans stay within, with, by, within um, the 1.5 scenario. So we need to keep that within reach. And then we, we, we added two um, core systems that need most fundamentally changed. And the first one is energy. And what we've done is uh, companies are asking for G20 leaders to commit to phasing out coal-fired power generation by 2030 for the advanced economies. That's pretty much the entire EU, um, and 2040 by other for others. So that means that other countries should quicker move away from coal than they might have otherwise planned. And second is then to end new coal power development and coal financing immediately. And what we're seeing now, for example, with China having said we're no longer going to invest in, in new coal-fired power abroad, that sets the way. It, it's a matter of, of when the shift is happening, but the G20 leaders can together accelerate that. And then the other part is finance. And finance is about uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies by 2025, delivering on the 100 billion finance commitments to developing countries 
um, making sure that climate related financial disclosures for corporations be has become mandatory and finally to put a meaningful price on carbon combined with other policies to make sure that the full cost of climate change is reflected if we're able to do these three things strengthen ndcs and the energy system and the finance system that supports all the other systems that need changing industry uh, transport built environments um, and even nature because of course finance we need to not just protect nature but also invest in it now this letter was signed by more than 600 companies covering all having operation all g20 countries um, of which more than 250 have operations in the eu and 150 of those companies have their headquarters in the eu so the eu is really well represented there 2.15 trillion euros in revenue and employing more than 8.5 million people worldwide so the eu has an opportunity to leverage the voice of these businesses that have signed this letter and use that to as encouragement to set a stronger ambition for the EU, both at the G20 as well as leading into the COP. Now, at COP, it will be key for the EU to protect the integrity of the Paris Agreement. And there's again three things keeping the 1.5 goal within reach, as I mentioned. And with, um, with the EU has with its, with its Green Deal ambition and plans, the credibility and the legitimacy to take that leadership role and protect that 1.5 goal. It's also important for them to align climate finance with 1.5 and making sure that adaptation and developing countries are, are included this in earnest. So it's not just about financing the wealthy countries, it's also about bringing the rest on board. And it's not only anymore about mitigation, but about adaptation. And then there's a third area to make sure that the Article 6, which several of the previous people have mentioned, um, retains its environment integrity so we don't get any leakage or double counting um, and again emphasizes the role of carbon pricing and that article 6 is actually possibly the most critical piece on the table at the COP negotiation simply because if the financing is organized well and there are clear rules then that allows um, the private financing to be unleashed and everybody understands public financing is, is important uh, also send a signal but without private finance we won't get there and with that it's also then important to make sure that the businesses are considered in the global stock take because it's a collective process and uh, business make a contribution to that and then finally post-cop so um, people are looking at cop i think everybody will have a week sleep after that but where we're looking already be ahead of that g7 is going to be hosted by germany so again the eu will have a pretty important role to play in the, in the next year too. Now, within with the Fit for 55 package, the EU is the first major economy with detailed plans on how to implement its NDC. And uh, recognizing what's good for the climate is good for, for the environment and the economy. And if successfully delivered, it will, do, will bring those economic opportunities, as we also heard Frans Timmermans say, in renewable energy, energy efficiency, rollout electric vehicles, net zero technologies. So a success story in the EU will encourage other countries, including those in developing countries, to take a similar transformation. And many companies in the EU, including those that have signed that G20 letter, have various operations, not only in the EU, but also in those other countries that the EU could influence. So I encourage the EU to make use of those businesses and with their support, try and, and leverage or encourage other countries to, to follow suit. Um, and by doing so, they can not just encourage other countries, but they can also work together, policymakers and business, to create harmonized policies and business environments to de de decarbonize the value change, increase the investments in the green economy and decent jobs. So the EU has ample opportunities before the COP, uh, through the G20 summit, during the COP, and particularly protecting the integrity of the Paris Agreement, and after the COP, by continuing with his leadership role um, and working with business for um, ambition and action elsewhere in the world and making sure that whatever is introduced is standardized and harmonized and that will benefit global business. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, a, a really important contribution. Um, now we've, we've heard lots of European voices and we've had lots of um, commentary on the role of Europe. Um, in this international space, um, but I'm very pleased to bring in a perspective from outside Europe. So we have uh, Joanne uh, Jawic, uh, the CEO of the National Business Initiative of South Africa. Uh, Joanne, 
uh, we'd be lovely to hear from you and hear your thoughts about COP26 and the opportunity it provides. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Elliot. And it's a great, great pleasure to be speaking um, at, at this event. I've been listening in and have learned um, a lot today about the, the the detail and the approach and where the EU is at. And I thought I would do two things. I think the first thing is to really talk about where South Africa is at um, in relation to our preparation as a country for COP26 and specifically to talk a little bit about what business is doing. And then secondly, to talk about how I would see the relationship between the EU and the developing world moving forward um, in relation to both uh, sustaining, keeping, as, as people in this uh, conversation have spoken of keeping 1.5 degrees alive, as well as a net zero 2050 um, set of targets. Okay, so, so I think that South Africa, as you all know, is a energy uh, intensive and high emitting country. Um, over the last few years, there has been a huge amount of work done in order to try and build national consensus around the need for a fairly radical decarbonisation pathways to be put in place in South Africa. And really the issue of climate, um, like for the rest of the developing world, is, is critical in our context uh, because of the impacts of, of, of climate change, as well as all of the issues around climate risk and trade risk. If we, uh, if, if, if we keep on the kind of current development path that we are on. Uh, what that has resulted in is firstly in an NDC uh, that has been uh, put forward by the South African government that is 1.5 degree aligned. Um, and that in putting that forward, that has had intensive public engagement and has had business pushing government at some points and supporting uh, walking alongside government at others in order to be able to put this uh, ambitious NDC on the table. So I think that that has been a really, really important thing. The conversation around an ambitious NDC has um, resulted in major movement, I would argue, in the kind of development path that the country sees for itself. Um, secondly, there has been significant work done within the business community in South Africa over the last year, um, headed by both my organization as well as by um, Business Unity South Africa, which is um, our apex business organization. And, and what we've done is to put together a set of 2050 transition pathways uh, for different sectors of the economy. Uh, for the power sector, for petrochemicals, for the Afolu sector, for transport, um, for mining, for, for gas, and for green hydrogen that sets out uh, for business how these different sectors could start moving towards a net zero 2050. And that work has been led by a grouping of around 30 CEOs from the country's largest companies and from the country's largest emitting companies. And what that has brought us to is a situation where we can go into the COP as business aligned with government on the need for um, a net zero 2050 and where we believe that we in, are in a situation um, as a developing country to really demonstrate in a very fundamental way our commitment to be able to stand alongside the rest of the globe in terms of addressing climate change and reaching, reaching our goals. Um, in relation to the kind of uh, partnerships and issues that we then go into the COP with in relation to the developed world, um, I think it's been said a number of times in this conversation that clearly uh, this is being seen as a finance COP. I think the time has come after years and years of um, negotiation post Copenhagen initially and then post Paris to be able to say that the money is on the table and uh, there is a very serious commitment to support the developing world, both in relation to um, accelerated decarbonisation as well as in relation to being able to put serious money into addressing the impacts of climate change and uh, the issues of adaptation and resilience. I think secondly, if you look at a country like South Africa, we are going to the COP with um, a decarbonisation plan for our power sector, um, with a plan that we have, we believe that we are 
uh, very well positioned to start working on the establishment of green hydrogen industry in South Africa. And so what we would see ourselves wanting to engage with the EU on are the establishment of a set of partnerships um, and not a, not a kind of donor recipient set of partnerships, but a set of mutual investments around issues of trade, of technology, of R&D, and of the need for us to be able to start working together in a much more fundamental partnership where we recognize um, our strengths and our capacities to support each other in what is going to be a very, very difficult uh, road that we all have to walk. I, I don't think that we can um, pretend that this is an easy, an, an easy road. Certainly in our country, it not only demands huge levels of leadership and political will, but it demands uh, enormous levels of mobilization and building of social consensus, including being able to address the issues of a just transition in order to be able to ensure that once we get on this path, that we don't get off it. And so I think the COP26 is a critically important moment. I think that my sense is, is that a lot of African countries and many developing countries are going to be coming to the COP uh, with commitments and uh, intentions to act that go far beyond what has been on the table before. And I think it would be really important that in the relationship between the EU and the developing world, that we use the opportunity of the COP to bed those down. Thanks. Thank you, Joanne. Um, uh, some immensely useful comments there. And I think, you know, really helpful to open up that dialogue in terms of the, an EU South Africa conversation. And I couldn't have picked a better theme to finish on in some ways than that one about partnerships. I think if we had a bit more time, we would have more of a, a dialogue or a discussion about, you know, the role of partnerships in COP26 with all of the panelists. But unfortunately, we've we've essentially basically run out of time. We've had a number of really good good questions that we haven't had a chance to get to on things like aviation and shipping, on um, other kind of key parts of the energy transition, the, the rise of energy prices, the role of electrification. Um, but hopefully everybody has found it a useful conversation and I certainly have and I will kind of remind people that the recording of this will be up on our website. But to bring us all to a close and to kind of neatly tie all these threads together in a knot, if, if that's not too um, too big an ask, I want to hand over to CISL Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership CEO Claire Shine um, for a summary and closing remarks and reflections. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, it makes it sound like I'm in a cat's cradle with uh, a real tangle of threads. Um, thank you all to the speakers for the great questions. It's a tall order to try and pull some of those strands together. I will humbly try recognising it's very imperfect. And I've tried to pull things together from both the panels um, with around three hooks. The first is about realism about the starting point, humility actually, and what we will really need to achieve this paradigm shift. So uh, Sharon emphasised right from the start what in my language is the just transition, that you need buy-in from and benefit to the entire society, and that is an absolute bedrock for moving forward for a just transition. One speaker said a status quo can never be a just transition. Someone else said no transition without just transition. And as Carol said, we have to go both deep and broad. Um, in an audience like this, although we come at it with different experience, fundamentally it's possible to say e the economy and climate are 100% aligned. But we also have to remember, as I think Duro said, that um, there is less visible dragging power that may hold us back in some countries or in some sectors that there are there is much deeper political division than we may want to think and that need for an overarching social agreement and shared understanding is something that we have to build and so messaging matters and coming at the messaging with fresh eyes and understanding that some of the language we may use or the assumptions we may bring may simply not be valid for some constituencies perhaps particularly in that post-covid collectively bruised society that many of us around the world are inhabiting and therefore to think about how 
creatively you prepare a household. As Sophie said, how do you bring others on board? How do you build social acceptance of an entire package? I think that's a really interesting challenge. And um, as Elliot will know, I will often think about new types of voices and agency that may help us in that space. For example, cultural innovators and new kinds of mediators. The second package was around leadership and legitimacy. We had a lot of emphasis which, I, emphasis, which I warmly welcome, around accountability, around due diligence, that transparency is fundamental to move the transition in the right direction. As I myself said, we can't just do the wrong thing better or appear to advise others to do the wrong thing better. Um, Kaya talked about the improvement of national data management capacities. Uh, Ationa talked about climate determination. And there was a loud agreement that we must keep that 1.5 degrees alive and kicking at COP26. Several of you, including Thomas Lingard, spoke to this need for a higher level ambition. We're talking here um, about floor, not ceiling. And there was the nice metaphor of moving beyond thinking like do no harm as used to be said in the field of medicine, to becoming proactively net positive and advancing regenerative models of business. We heard some issues about some tensions, particularly from Pascal Confant, um, the tension on the time frame that 2030 is too soon for true industrial transformation, but it's too slow for climate. So that issue of being able to talk openly about urgency and quality how we get it right, but understand that perfection may not be within our grasp straight away. Um, that was another key point. Um, there was also the, again, I will use the word humility, that understanding that stringency is critical, but we are also in post-COVID recovery, and therefore the way we talk to these issues must also pass that legitimacy test with many constituencies. The, re the raising the bar, the higher ambition, came out strongly with a call for smart co-working between progressive businesses, many of whom are on this call, and ministers and MEPs, and also the need for clarity. How are we going to change? How are we going to show the world that we are willing to do what it takes? And uh, in that context, we heard that feeling about the critical mass that a litmus test is whether companies will sign up to the race to zero to really demonstrate that commitment. And Joanne gave some great examples of these sector-specific transition pathways and the way in which we can think about bolder policy pivots that can help some of those sectors and make quicker progress. And the last point under the leadership and legitimacy related to getting the right mix <clears throat> of tools and instruments. Um, there was several comments in the chat box about the need for better alignment of incentives to enable corporates, for example, to adapt to clean energy, and the importance of policy not lagging behind business, many of you are signatories, to the letter, which is actually showing that if business is going to go far further, faster and more boldly, then we need that right playing field to encourage uh, the legal certainty and the incentive mix. And finally, and very briefly, my third hook was obviously around opportunity, as Frank Timmermans highlighted. I like the way that we think of Fit for 55, there you are Elliot, I've tried to say it, more as a mission, it's not jargon, it's a mission, it's a forward pathway that we can really use together as a stake in the ground. A green deal, is a growth strategy. It's something to improve life and life chances for the millions, for the hundreds of millions. And that's a very important frame to the messaging. And it can truly act as a springboard for transformative investment in new infrastructure, new sectors, new products, and so on. And wrapping up, the EU in this, in this context is beautifully positioned uh, to make a real difference. It has taken the risk, it has embarked on the journey of plotting this multi-year pathway, and that can really inspire businesses across sectors and also other countries and regions worldwide. And again, to close on Joanne's words, that is not something that is Europe looking in, it is Europe looking out and giving out, but also learning from without so that we have really constructive feedback loops and sharing of innovation for the global public good. So I'm now breathless. I hope that that was coherent in terms of pulling some of my key takeaways together. And I just want to thank again all of you 
for giving us your very valuable time to share your inputs. Hope to meet lots of you in Glasgow. And I want to thank Elliot and the whole of the CISL team, the CLG Europe team, uh, and everybody involved in the Green Growth Partnership for bringing to together everything that went into making today happen. So thank you very much and good luck with all your work going forward. Bye-bye for now.